Hello and good afternoon to everybody watching our stream over on Facebook Live. We hope everybody had a good break. I'm Regina and I'm your host for the Frequently Asked Topics on the 8-Bar Subjects. Earlier today, we had Judge Hanarguito answer FAQs about remedial law, criminal procedure, and if you weren't able to catch it, you may always refer back to our previous live streams through the past Facebook page. We would like to mention that our event partner, Rex Bookstore, recently released a free digital copy of Bar Prep, Ready, Set, Pass, a light read on useful tips for the bar exam. This material was prepared by lawyers for would-be lawyers, a product of collective wisdom and born out of shared genuine concern for the profession and the men and women who make it great. You may get your own copy through the link found on the PALS Facebook post. This lecture series is brought to you by the Philippine Association of Law Schools in collaboration with Rex Boxer and Edo Campion. To know more about this month's event partner, let's all watch this video. It is a noble aspiration to want to dedicate one's life in service of those who are oppressed and defenseless against the unfair and the unjust. It is an admirable advocacy in an adult, but it is awe-inspiring for a child to dream of speaking for those who are voiceless, to stand up in defense of the law and the common good. Because while every child dreams of a future, not every child is like you who dreams of shifting society and changing the world and thought leaders so jante pa lang ako 1990 publishing rex materials helped me in reviewing for the bar exam most of the books that i used in law school were published by rex and i practically used the same old law books during the bar review as they were complete and comprehensive being then a working student it was financially hard to buy new books. Good thing Rex offered these law books at an affordable price. Also, the books published by Rex are known for their quality. The law books that I purchased from Rex and those that I borrowed from the school library, mostly published by Rex, became my strong armor, weapon, and constant companion as I hurdled the challenging life in law school. It is an honor to become part of Rex's family, and I am proud and happy to be with the best publisher in legal education. Rex Education implements an uncompromised editorial process to ensure quality content. In fact, Rex Education Law Books have received numerous book centenary awards by the Supreme Court. Because legal education is continuously evolving, Rex Education continuously innovates in legal education. There have been challenges, but Filipinos have always risen above, and we are thankful for the support. Rex Education's legacy in championing lifelong learning continues despite the changes in the landscape of legal education. And because we recognize those changes, Rex Education is able to provide the appropriate solution. Rex Education digital products and online platforms made our learning materials more accessible to the learners, which enabled them to have a better grasp of their dreams of becoming a lawyer. Education has bar reviewers to gear you up for your review subjects and help you pass the bar. For you, who's braving new beginnings, Rex Education has instructive books and learning solutions for new and seasoned lawyers. Once again, thank you Rex Bookstore and Edo Campion for partnering with us on this event. Now on to the second part of today's lectures. We will be addressing FAQs about commercial law. And to guide us through this topic, we have Dean Nilo Divina to answer the topic's most asked questions. Danilo T. Divina is a seasoned corporate and banking lawyer with over 30 years of experience in the industry. He established Divina Law in 2006 and has led the aggressive growth of the firm in a short span of time, making it one of the biggest law firms in the country today. Before he entered private law practice, Dean Nilo was the former executive vice president, general counsel, and corporate secretary of one of the former leading banks in the Philippines. He also served as the general manager, executive advisor to the board, and corporate secretary of the Philippine Charity Sweepstakes Office. 
Dean Hilo is also the personal lawyer of some of the country's prominent personalities in finance and business. Dean Hilo is equally active with his roles in the academe, serving as the Dean of the Faculty of Civil Law of the University of Santo Tomas since 2009 and teaching in the University of the Philippines College of Law. He is likewise recognized in the Philippines as one of the top experts in commercial law and is a sought-after bar reviewer and legal consultant. Dean Hilo has authored five books in commercial law that are considered as primary resource material for law students and lawyers alike. He has received numerous awards and citations as an academician, practicing lawyer, and managing partner. Divina Law has similarly received various awards and distinctions because of Dean Hilo's pioneering ways of managing a law firm and the firm's brand of dynamic lawyer lawyering. With all of these recognitions, Dean Hilo has been consistently named among the top lawyers in the Philippines. Dean Hilo obtained his Bachelor of Law from the University of Santo Tomas Faculty of Civil Law, where he graduated magna cum laude and class valedictorian. Without further ado, let's all welcome our second lecturer for today, Dean Hilo Divina. Let's start a pre-week lecture in commercial law, uh, based, of course, on the reduced syllabus by uh, Justice Marvick Leone. Okay, so let, let's start our pre-week lecture in commercial law. We always start, of course, with a prayer. Um, this is what we composed for our barrister years ago. Uh, of course, it's as timely as ever. Dear God, source of all my deep and darkness, Things you have learned and yet to learn. Faith, secure the truth that you are with me all the days of your life. Hope, we are the anchor of all I am and hope to be. Ready to the potential that I may discern and glorify your will. I pray, I pray, Lord, that you grant my desire to exalt and preach to the thoughts of my more excellence. Help me to do my best and override my preparations for your grace. Among me, strengthen me and embrace me dearly because though with limitations, I offer this bar as a way to seek your kingdom. Or asking is better than seek you first, the kingdom of God. And everything will be added unto you. Teach me to persevere, to work diligently, to pray unceasingly and to rest your promises and above all in your unfailing love. In the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and through the session of our Mount Mary, Saint David of the Lord, I pray. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, we will be done on earth. Because they are the regret and forgive us our trespasses, forgive us trust in the It is God Blessed are thou, women, and blessed is the fruit of thy Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, and the God of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because the beginning is not ever shall be born without the name. The Father is not called his name. All right, so first off, let's define the parameters. So this uh, lecture will include potentials, of course, of Judge Marvick Leonen and the so-called canonical doctrines, but uh, uh, guided by the reduced syllabus. Now, while the notes are broadly covered the prescribed topics, the focus, which you will see later highlighted in red font, is on likely essay questions that call for a solution of issues in arriving at a conclusion based on the law. Again, consistent with the guidelines issued by uh, Justice Marvick. Now, the rest of the notes can be used as basis if the questions asked fall outside the coverage of the lecture. 
There are only six questions in commercial law, right? But uh, accounting for 10% of the total grade. So therefore, let us sincerely pray and genuinely hope we get it right. If it fails, your accumulated stock knowledge and state of preparedness, I assure you, will pull you through. So first off, corporations regarding classes of corporation. Next. Now, of the uh, kinds of corporation, okay, let's start with the most basic. Uh, as regards existence of shares of stock, you have, of course, stock and non-stock corporation. To refresh your memory, stock corporations are those with capital stock divided into shares and authorized to distribute surplus profit to the holders of their shares based on the shares held by them. Now, the rest are non-stock corporations. While Section 3 of the Revised Corporation Code defines non-stock corporation in the negative or by default, meaning a corporation without a capital stock divided into shares and or not allowed to distribute dividends or surplus profit to the members. The purposes of non-stock corporation are, of course, found in another section, in the six now of the RCC. All right. Having that in mind, a stock corporation is one with the capital stock divided into shares and authorized to distribute dividends to a uh, the stockholders based on the shares held by them, and the rest non-stock operation. Let's take a look at the first potential bar exam question in commercial law. Next slide, fellow. All right, next. This one, uh, BCDA versus CA. So the law of creating the basis and conversion, basis conversion development authority of BCDA provides that it's an authorized capital of 100 billion pesos that may be fully subscribed by the government and should either be paid up from the proceeds of the sales of its land assets. What about the purpose? It is created, among others, to hold and or administer military reservations in the country and convert them into productive use. All right, so BCDA sold a real property and got slapped taxes and wanted to file, of course, wanted to obtain a refund of the taxes paid and file a petition for the fund accordingly. Now, is it liable or exempt from payment of uh, filing fees? If it is stock or non-stock operation, of course, it has to pay the filing fee, but if it's only a government instrumentality, not a stock or a non-stock operation, then not liable to pay a uh, filing fee. And the Supreme Court said that BCDA is not neither stock nor non-stock operation. And why is it not a stock operation? Because while there's an authorized capital of 100 billion, it's not divided into shares of stock, right? So what would be a good example? It should be 100 billion pesos divided into 100 billion shares per value of 1 peso or 100 billion shares per value of 10 pesos per share. You all know that when you multiply the authorized number of shares with the par value, it will produce, of course, or it will result into the authorized capital stock of the corporation. In this case, it has a capital, right? But not divided into shares. And then there is no authority to distribute dividends to the stockholders of BCDA. So on that ground, it's not a stock corporation. What about non-stock? Supreme Court, like I said, as you pointed out, it's not a non-stock operation likewise because it's not organized for any of the purposes allowed for non-stock operation, right? Civic, charitable, fraternal, literary, educational, religious, and similar purposes. So the charter of BCDA provides for the purpose to convert into productive use military reservations of the government. X. X. Right now, as to governing law, another potential uh, bar exam question. Let's take a look. Um, you have two kinds, of course, GOCC and private corporation. GOCC governed by special law creating it, and the provisions of the RCC apply superiorly. To the extent, of course, applicable. There's a conflict between the provision of the RCC. And the charter created in the GOCC, of course, the charter prevails. We all know that. And private governed by the RCC. The RCC governing law 
for non-chartered GOCC. Now, what are the elements of a GOCC? Now, the question for the, the question, what are the elements? Not like to be asked in the bar, given that uh, it will be asked a question. But these elements will guide us in answering a possible question if a corporation is a GOCC. All right. So, what are the elements of a GOCC? First, established by original charter or governed by the general law of corporation, which means it can either be stock or non-stock, right? Second, vested functions functions that relate to public needs, whether governmental or proprietary, and directly owned or controlled by the government. Let's take a look at the first element. It says established by original charter. There's a special law creating the GOCC, right? Or it is organized under the general corporation law, which is, of course, the revised corporation code. Now, then under the general corporation law, the RCC, it can be stock or non-stock operation. So therefore, it's either created by a special charter uh, passed by Congress, or it is either a stock or non-stock operation organized under the revised corporation code. So just because, just because there is no charter creating the corporation doesn't mean it's not a GOCC. Because it can be organized likewise under the general corporation law. So the other elements, therefore, should be uh, taken into account determining whether a stock or non-stock operation is considered a GOCC. Next. So with that in mind, this is a case penned by Justice Marvick Lauren, of course. Is Corredor Foundation a GOCC? And the answer is yes. It's organized as a non-stock operation, right? Under the then corporation code. Well, of course, now under the RCC. It was not created under the special charter. But it was organized primarily to maintain, preserve war relics to promote and develop the area's potential as a tourist destination, whether nationally or locally. So therefore, the purposes of the Corridor Foundation under the AOI relates to public need. The function is public in character. Right. And the Supreme Court said, as we pointed out a while ago, it's not necessary that the GOCC be created by special charter. It can be stock or non-stock operation as long as it relates to the public function or need and owned or controlled by the government. Next. Okay. Now, what about the fact that the employees of Corredor Foundation are not under the jurisdiction of the Civil Service Commission? Does it mean that just because they are not under the supervision, of civil service, it's not a GOCC. But the answer is no. Right? So under the Constitution, the jurisdiction of civil service commission only pertains to corporations with original charter and not to those corporations that are not created by a special law or the charter of their own, like the Redor Foundation. And of course, we have to add that uh, being under the jurisdiction of the Civil Service Commission is not an element, of course, of a GOCC, right? We saw three elements, and the uh, jurisdiction of Civil Service is not one of them. Now, of course, for those employees that of the corporations or corporations that are governed by special charter, the Civil Service has jurisdiction. Now, in contrast, the Supreme Court, likewise, does Marvick Leon and pointed out that uh, these corporations we'll see are not GOCCs. First one, Philippine Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. And then MECO, Manila Economic Culture Office and Executive Committee of the Metro Manila Film Festival. All of them were declared not GOCCs. Now, regarding the, the first one, the uh, Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. So by amendment to the law, that created the corporation, it removed the power to apprehend offenders and to serve process in connection with the rest of offenders. So the public function, therefore, of the corporation was removed. That's why it's not considered a GOCC anymore. Now, what about MECO? MECO, Manila Economic Culture Office, of course, the office uh, created to facilitate economic, 
cultural ties relationship between the Philippines and the Taiwan government. We only have, uh, we all recognize one China, the People's Republic of China, right? So we don't recognize Taiwan as another China, but we do have cultural relations and ties with um, with uh, Taiwan. And MECO is the office created for this purpose. Is MECO a GOCC? Some people said no, because it's not owned or controlled by the government. Same thing with the second committee or the Metro Manila Film Festival, uh, because not organized as stock or non-stock operation. However, uh, despite the fact that they're not GOCCs, just to be clear, now for political law, of course, uh, they are subject to all the jurisdiction of COA because they receive funds or the, the fees that they charge, like for MECO, partake of public funds. Next. Now, as legal status, you have the URE, de facto, cooperation by Stoppel, cooperation by prescription. Now, let's focus our discussion on de facto cooperation because of a case that is a potential bar exam question. Now, what is a de facto cooperation? We all know it is one organized with tolerable compliance with the requirements of a valid law. Existence cannot be attacked or inquired into collaterally. It can only be attacked through a direct proceeding called co warranto so meaning it's allowed to exist, as you all know, until the state questions its existence because of defect in its formation or organization. Next. And then cooperation by Stoppel, what exists when two more persons assume to act as a cooperation when they have no legal authority to do so. They all know that um, those who claim or assume themselves to be a cooperation even though without authority to do so, rely as general partners for all obligations incurred or arising as a result thereof. And that ostensible cooperation, of course, not allowed to invoke its lack of legal personality on any transaction entered into or toward it committed. At the same time, uh, one assumes an obligation to ostensible cooperation cannot resist performance on the ground that, in fact, there was no cooperation. Now, I would like you to focus uh, your attention on the second sentence of the definition of cooperation by Stobel. It says, ostensible cooperation uh, can invoke its lack of legal personality if it gets sued in a transaction or a transaction entered into or a tort that it committed. That's the, the most common side of the doctrine of cooperation by Stobel. So the sensible cooperation, okay, let's say it's not a cooperation, so it cannot deny its existence as regards persons who relied on the representation that they are a cooperation on any transaction it entered into or tort that it committed. Now, the other side, not often, of course, applied, but still equally important and equally true, is that one who resists or one who enters into a contract or assumes an obligation or ostensible cooperation cannot resist performance on the ground that in fact there was no cooperation. But this is very important when we take a look at the case of uh, Miss Nara's sisters of Our Lady of Fatima versus Olsona. Thanks. Uh, stewardship of management control. So, okay, let's include this in our, uh, in our discussion. What is a holding cooperation? It's a, it uh, is a cooperation that holds stocks in other companies for the purpose of control, not just investment. So it basically owns various subsidiaries. So they control the uh, subsidiaries under a conglomerate or umbrella structure for adoption, let's say, of common policies. Next. Now, as regards holding cooperation, this is a potential question. Given that 2018 decision, not penned by Justice Marvick, but penned by the Chief Justice, uh, uh, by Chief Justice Gizmondo, is the holding corporation liable for the claims of its subsidiary or subsidiaries? So, given that it controls, right, the subsidiaries in shares and sometimes even policies. And the Supreme Court said that mere ownership of all or nearly all of the capital stock of the corporation 
not enough reason to disregard the separate legal personality of the holding company from the subsidiary. There are three elements under the alter ego test. All of them should be present before the separate legal personality can be disregarded. The first one is control. But control not just in shares, right? but also in finances and business practices and policies, such that the corporation had no money of its own with respect to the transaction attack. Second, that control was used to perpetrate fraud or violate the duty in contravention of the plaintiff's right. And third, the control in breach of duty, the approximate cause of the harm suffered by the plaintiff. And these elements are not present. The first element is present, but the second and third were not proven that's why the ruling was the holding company not liable for the claims of the employees of which it should be. Next. Next. As to place of incorporation, let's include this in our discussion. You all know uh, the distinction between domestic and foreign cooperation. Domestic uh, form organized and existing under Philippine laws. A foreign cooperation is one that is organized uh, and existing under any laws other than those, of course, in the Philippines, and whose laws allow Filipino citizens to do business in its own country or state. I included uh, that distinction in our discussion because of this question. Is a corporation organized in USA but composed entirely of Filipinos, domestic or a foreign corporation? For well, the answer to this question, it is a foreign corporation despite the fact that its stockholders are all Filipino citizens. If the test is not the composition or nationality of uh, stockholders, but the place of incorporation and formation. Having been organized in USA is a foreign corporation despite the facts composed entirely of Filipinos. And a possible question likewise, is it a Philippine national? Can it invest in, let's say, equity of corporations engaged in nationalized activity? Next slide, sir. There you go. Uh, the answer is, the answer is yes. It's a Philippine national, kindly backtrack. It's a Philippine national because it's composed entirely of Filipinos provided it is registered as doing business in the Philippines under the FIA, Foreign Investment Act, right? So these are the elements for a foreign corporation to be considered a Philippine national, composed entirely of Filipinos, registered as doing business in the Philippines, right? And as such, it can invest in the equity of corporations engaged in nationalized activity. Next. Now, other classification, uh, one person cooperation, uh, we have separate discussion for that. So, um, like a potential, of course, potential bar exam question, given that uh, this is the first time that there will be a question based on the RCC. And the, the two standout provisions of the RCC that should, not, of course, escape our attention are the automatic conversion from fixed term to perpetual existence of corporations organized prior to the activity of the revised corporation code. And second, the provision on one-person cooperation. What's a one-person cooperation? Obviously, cooperation with only one stockholder. It is valid, right? Even though it's only one stockholder, as long as organized for local purpose, and of course, no grant exists to warrant piercing the bait of corporate fiction. Next. Okay, next. May Congress enact a special law to create a private corporation for we all know the answer to be unconstitutional with the formation and the organization of private corporation, as we said a while ago, governed by general law and cooperation as passed by Congress. Congress can enact a special law only to create a government-owned and controlled corporation. Next. Okay, next. Elements of the fact cooperation. Well, uh, unfortunately, the presentation does not include no, which ones are red font, but the notes that we provided to you I will indicate what are those red fonts or uh, what are those questions and red fonts. Um, of course, those are the must uh, read portion of the notes. It's not that you should not read all of them, but uh, our, our discussion, our presentation, our lecture based on those uh, 
uh, points highlighted in red. But it does not reflect here. It doesn't show it here. But anyway, I know what are those uh, items, obviously. Elements of a de facto cooperation. There are three, as you all know. Existence of a body law under which it is incorporated or organized. Second, bona fide attempt to incorporate. And third, act for exercise of corporate powers. And as we said, if um, the law under which the cooperation was uh, created or incorporated turned out to be unconstitutional or declared to be unconstitutional, then it's not even a de facto cooperation. Next. Now, the second element is very important for us, given a potential bar some question. The second element is attempt, bona fide attempt to incorporate. So the Supreme Court said, there can be no bona fide attempt to incorporate unless, at the very least, there is certificate of registration or incorporation issued by the SEC. Therefore, mere filing of the articles of incorporation, right, is not enough to create a de facto cooperation. What marks the beginning of a de facto cooperation is the issue of certificate of incorporation by the SEC. Next. In this case that I mentioned a while ago, this is the reason why we discussed the fact cooperation, cooperation by Stobel, among the other classifications or kinds of uh, cooperation. So, purification, a spinster, was well, that, at that time, uh, she died in 201, registered owner of real property located in Calamba, Laguna. Uh, she wanted to be a nun. But that could not be materialized, so she became instead a benefactor of the uh, Missionary Sisters of Our Lady of Fatima. Now, Purification uh, donated that property to the uh, Missionary Sisters because the latter was not registered with the SEC. So the Mother Superior, one who took care of uh, Purification, uh, upon the advice of the Council of Purification, filed the corresponding application for registration with the SEC on August 28, 2001. One day after, okay, one day after, Sean signed the deed of donation in favor of the missionary sisters. And then on April, or October 30 rather, uh, Sean died without any cause. Survived only by her brother of half-blood, Amando Alsona. On April 9, 2002, uh, Amando filed a complaint before the RTC to nullify the donation on the ground that when it was made, there was no cooperation registered with the SEC. The Mr. Sisters of Valeria Fatima was not juridically cooperated, therefore cannot receive donation. Okay, first potential barring some question was Mr. Sisters of Our Lady of Fatima a de facto cooperation at the time of the donation. And the answer obviously is yes, right? As we saw a while ago, because what marks the beginning of a de facto cooperation is not the filing per se of the articles of the cooperation, but the issue on certificate of the cooperation by the SEC. So there can be no bona fide attempt to cooperate unless at the very least as she pointed out a while ago, certificate of incorporation issued by the SEC. Now, if you remember, we uh, highlighted the relevant dates, right? August 28, deed of the nation. August 29, the uh, application was filed with the SEC. All right. And then, well, of course, uh, it's not stated here, but uh, August 30, the certificate of incorporation was issued by the SEC. By the time of the donation, there was a certificate of incorporation issued by the SEC. Therefore, it's not a de facto cooperation. Next. Now, whether civil law or commercial law doesn't matter, right? Was the donation valid? And the Supreme Court, uh, of course, combined principles of civil law and commercial law and declared to be valid. So that's the reason why commercial civil law are together, right? They're kindred spirits, kindred laws, you may say. Uh, and proven uh, by uh, by the combination of civil law and commercial law into one subject. 
Okay. Was the donation valid? Supreme Court said it's valid because even though it was, it is true that when the donation was, was accepted, the donor was not yet incorporated, but the subsequent incorporation of the donor incorporation and the affirmation of the recipient's authority to accept on behalf cured whatever defect that may have attended the donation based on the document of cooperation by Stobel. Now, why did the Supreme Court apply the document of cooperation by Stobel? Is it not, we said, the most common application of the doctrine is the ostensible cooperation not permitted or allowed to invoke its lack of legal personality on transaction it entered into or toward it committed, right? But how come in this case, in the other way around? Uh, there, there is no third party who relied on the representation that it's a cooperation. It's because the Supreme Court said, as you pointed out a while ago, there are two sides to the cooperation by Stoppel. The first side, uh, the one we pointed out, of course, openly used, but let's not forget, likewise, the second side of the cooperation by Stoppel doctrine. What is that? One who assumes obligation to an extensive cooperation can resist performance on the ground that, in fact, there was no cooperation. So that, that side of doctrine of cooperation by Stoppel was applied in this case to affirm that the nation was, in fact, valid. Uh, what is a cooperation soul? Uh, of course, included by Justice Marvick in the reduced syllabus. We all know this is a cooperation that is associated with a church, uh, not, not, not just Roman Catholic Church, or not just any, any Catholic church, but any church in the sect or denomination for that matter. It is one which is formed by the uh, presiding head, bishop, rabbi, elder of the religious denomination, second church, for the purpose of administering the affairs, the priorities, and estate of the um, religious denomination or sect or church. Now, possible question cooperation zone. May a cooperation zone acquire property, real property, and hold the same if the presiding bishop or head or elder is a foreigner? And of course, the answer, uh, yes, obviously, right? A cooperation zone, regardless of nationality of the presiding bishop or elder or, or rabbi, may acquire real property, provided that at least 60% of the members of the religious cooperation, religious uh, uh, sector denomination are Filipino citizens. Because the, the bishop who organized himself in the cooperation soul acquires a juridical character different from his lay character or natural character. If he's not organized in the cooperation soul, he could not acquire private land or real property in the Philippines because he's a foreigner. But having organized or formed himself in the cooperation soul, he acquires a juridical character distinct from his natural character. And as such, as trustee for his church, he may acquire real property in the Philippines, as long as at least 60% of the members are Filipino citizens. Another potential bar exam question, may a cooperation soul uh, convey or encumber its real property without court intervention? You all know, and general, the general rule is that um, the cooperation soul cannot dispose of, encumber, alienate property without uh, court intervention, right? So it has to get court approval. Except in the rules of the uh, cooperation soul, meaning there is a church denomination, regulate already the manner of disposition or encumbrance of real property. And if those regulations are complied with, then court intervention is not required necessary. Now, of course, if there are no provisions or rules regarding uh, disposition and encumbrance of property of the corporation sole, then court intervention is needed. Without court intervention, the sale is not binding on the corporation. Next. What is a one-person corporation? Well, we all know it's a single stockholder, a uh, corporation with single stockholder, provided the uh, only natural person, trust, or estate may form a OPC. Now, 
of course, there is a um, provision in the guidelines and the law, law on um, not what corporations are not allowed to incorporate as OPC. Well, actually, uh, all corporations right, are not allowed to incorporate as OPC because it can be organized only by natural person, trust, or estate. Next. Next. Now, the potential bar exam question on one person cooperation may the sole stockholder of the OPC be made liable beyond his subscription to the OPC? And of course, the answer obviously is no, right? Because a one person cooperation is also a cooperation. Despite the fact that it's one stockholder only. The basic principle of cooperation law regarding separate legal entity also applies, which means that the OPC has a separate legal personality from the sole stockholder composing it, and vice versa. And therefore, the uh, single or sole stockholder not liable beyond a subscription to the one person cooperation, provided the following elements are present or conditions are present. The first one, the sole stockholder must show that the corporation was adequately financed. He must prove that the property of the OPC is independent from his personal property and there is no ground to pierce the veil of corporate fiction. If any or all of these elements not present, then the sole stockholder should be liable jointly severally with the one person corporation. <laughs> All right, uh, of course, there will be no such kind of question, but I, had, I have to add this in relation to our previous discussion, whether or not the, um, the uh, OPC or the sole stockholder of the OPC may be held liable beyond a subscription to the corporation. Now, of course, if it is not an OPC, but a sole proprietorship, the answer will be different. So that's why you have this slide. How do you distinguish OPC from a sole proprietorship. OPC, of course, has separate legal personality from the sole stockholder composing it, whereas a sole proprietorship has no separate legal personality from the owner or proprietor of the business. And because of this first distinction, you have the second, the assets and abilities of the, the one person corporation are not assets and abilities of the sole stockholder composing it, whereas in a sole proprietorship, the assets and liabilities of the uh, sole proprietorship are those of the uh, proprietor or owner of the business likewise. And the third distinction, OPC registered with the SEC, whereas uh, sole proprietorship registered with DTI. Okay, moving on. Uh, composition of membership in board of directors, of course, as you know, included in the reduced syllabus. Next, for this topic, I choose as a likely, or I chose rather, as a likely uh, bar exam question, the canonical doctrine laid down in the case of Bogway versus SDC, 89 scrap. So assuming that the stockholders, all of those qualifications and none of the disqualifications to be director, and as in our votes, right? The measure of a board seat, does the stockholder then have vested the right to be elected as a director of the corporation? Okay, uh, of course, he has to have all the qualifications, none of these qualifications, right? So being a uh, stockholder per se does not guarantee that you be elected as director. Having enough shares in the corporation, not an assurance that you will get a board seat in the corporation. Because the corporation has the power, right, to amend its bylaws to include grounds for disqualification but prospective in application. In the case of Gong Wei, of course, you know that San Miguel Corporation amended its bylaws to include a provision that allows the corporation to disqualify any director of a competing corporation, any stockholder who owns more than 10% of the San Miguel stock of a competing corporation, or simply any person who represents an interest adverse to or contrary to the corporation. Now, is that a valid ground for disqualification if it is set forth in the bylaws. 
Although we all, all know the answer, right? It's a valid provision, uh, sustained and held by the Supreme Court in the case of Bogue versus SEC, right? And because that ground for disqualification exists, just because you have enough shares to be sure of board seat does not guarantee you a director position. They can be disqualified by the corporation grounds of conflict of interest. In fact, you all know that under the RC, RCC, uh, the scope of the disqualification was even expanded to include not just the right to disqualify you as a director, but the right of the corporation to prevent access to the competitor, even though he's a stockholder of the corporation. Next. Who is independent director? So I included this in our discussion. Uh, first, let's take a look at the definition. Who is independent director? He is a person, obviously, uh, um, a, a stockholder, right? Who apart from shareholdings and fees received from the corporation, independent of management and free from any business or other relationship that could or could reasonably be perceived to materially interfere with the exercise of independent judgment in carrying out the responsibilities of a director. Or an event director, just like uh, regular directors elected by the stockholders, present, title, the vote, and in absentia during the election of uh, directors. They're required to be a stockholder, right, of uh, the corporation, except for those corporations, non stock corporations that are vested to public interest. You can have a non member independent trustee. But for a stock corporation, it is required that the event director be a stockholder likewise. Next. So what corporations are required to have independent directors in their boards? Uh, of course, uh, those that are um, corporations that are vested with public interest. And these are examples, public companies as described under the uh, RCC or SRC rather. And then banks, quasi banks, non-stock, civil association, uh, NSFLA, of course, you always is a new uh, inclusion, pawn shops, corporation engaged in money service uh, business, pre-need, trust, and insurance companies, and basically other financial intermediaries. And other corporations, except those who have already enumerated, that are vested public interest as determined by the SEC. Now, what makes you a public corporation or public company, rather? Uh, there are two criteria, as you all know. Number one, your shares of stock are listed in the stock exchange, or even though not listed, you have at least 50 million assets with 200 stockholders at least owning 100 shares each. So 50 million assets, not paid up, not subscribed, but assets, at least 200 stockholders, each of those stockholders owning 100 shares each. So if that's the case, required to have independent direct. Next. Next. Now this is the reason why I included uh, the topic of independent director in our discussion. This is yet to be asked in the bar. At the same time, this become almost canonical because this is what's being applied by all corporations on how to determine the regular independent directors to serve as such. How do you cast the votes for regular independent directors? So what happened in this case? You have uh, two, of course, uh, Times, right? You have regular and independent directors. You cannot run as independent director if you don't have the qualification of independent director. Let's say it has 10 directors under the AOI, eight regular to independent directors. And let's say there are 10 nominees for regular directors and only two nominees for independent directors. Now the ninth, ninth nominee for regular director obtain a votes higher than the votes obtained or cast in favor of the independent director. So what will happen now? Can the ninth nominee for regular director, I mean the ninth nominee obtain the high, ninth highest number of votes, be elected as director of the corporation? And the answer is no. Because the votes for independent director are segregated. And we basically, uh, the top eight vote getters among nominees for regular directors are elected as regular directors, 
And if let's say there are four nominees for um, independent director, the top two vote getters, the top two highest candidates will be elected as uh, independent director. Now, what if the votes of independent less than the ninth nominee who obtained the highest number of votes, meaning the obtained the ninth highest number of votes? Would it mean that the regular nominee for the director can take the seat of the independent director? The answer is no, because the votes as we said will be segregated separate segregate the votes for regular and likewise independent directors so the top eight vote getters for example among nominees for regular director elected as such and the top two nominees among all the nominees for independent directors elected as such next now see powers duties prerogatives of board of directors X. 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 All the adverse policies is on the red font. Why? Just to remind you, uh, because the reduced syllabus includes powers, duties, right? Functions of the board slash stockholders, right? So when do you know if it's for the board, when do you know it's for the stockholder? While of course, you know uh, what are the corporate acts that the board alone can approve, corporate acts that the stockholders alone can approve, corporate acts that have to be approved by both the board and the stockholders by majority or two-thirds or majority, as the case may be. You all know this, and we discussed this in your corporation law, in your review. But a safe guide will be acts of management pertain to the board, acts of ownership pertain to stockholders of the corporation. Next. Business judgment rule. Now, I included this, one of those in red fonts. Uh, first, what is a business judgment rule? Questions of policy and management are left to the sound discretion of the board. The actions are not reviewable by the court nor by the stockholders, right? The court and the stockholders cannot supplant the judgment for the judgment of the board of directors. In their hands are the management of corporate affairs. Now, Part of the business judgment rule is to create committees. Create committees, right? In fact, under the RCC, uh, it's not explicit that the board may create committees. But can the board create a corporate office? Can the board create an executive committee invoking the business judgment rule? Next slide. Next. Next. There you go. Next. All right. Now, the Supreme Court said that the board, before the RCC provision even, the board has the power to create committees and fill those committees. It's pursuant to the business judgment rule. Right. But to the extent that these committees are needed to have the board run the affairs of the corporation, then they can be so created and the members duly appointed. But can the board, however, invoking the same business judgment rule, create a corporate office or create an executive committee? And the Supreme Court said it's not part of business judgment rule. It's not covered by the business judgment rule. The board can never create a corporate office. The board may create an ordinary office, like the board may create, uh, you know, office for, let's say, legal, office for personnel, right? But can never create a corporate office. A corporate office is set forth or has to be set forth in the bylaws of the corporation. It should be created by statute or by the stockholders, not by the board. Okay. And now, of course, uh, inter-corporate dispute is included in our discussion because it is in your syllabus, in your syllabus, but this is the reason for the inclusion of the business judgment rule. So the board may create ordinary office pursuant to the business judgment rule, but can never create a corporate office. The holder of a corporate office, as you all know, is a corporate officer. His removal is an inter-corporate controversy not cognizable by labor arbiter, but cognizable by the RDC. Whereas an ordinary office created by the board is not a corporate office, and therefore the holder of that ordinary office is not a corporate officer, his removal, if any, or termination of employment, if any, 
is not an intercorporate dispute but a labor controversy cognizable by the labor arbiter. More of that when we reach intercorporate dispute. What about committee? We already said that the board may create committees, right? But can never create an executive committee than a section 35 of the old code, not 34. If that committee, named executive committee, of course, will function like an executive under the corporation code. So if the committee that it will create can act on all matters in the board's competence. If it's like a mini board, right? A small board directors that can act on all matters within the board's competence. Did the board can create it? Will the board can delegate to a new board or small board the powers, all right? Uh, granted, of course, by uh, the uh, stockholders, by electing them to run the affairs of the corporation. Only the stockholders, only the owners of the corporation can decide whether to create a, an executive committee or a mini board no? that can be uh, like an adjunct of the board and act on those matters with the board's competence. Now, what if it is called Execom but will not perform like a board of director? In which case, the board may create it as part of the business judgment rule. Next. Okay, uh, another potential bar exam question, given that it is a new provision, the creation of an emergency board. Still on the powers, duties, prerogatives of board stockholders. Now, the power to create emergency board is not lodged with the stockholders, but lodged with the board of directors. Okay. So, supposing there's an emergency that has to be attended to, can is there any remedy available to the board if there is no quorum? Any answer? The remedy was provided by the revised corporation code. Next. So what are those requisites? Number one, the vacancy prevents the remaining directors from having a quorum. I said there are 15 directors uh, under the articles of the corporation and uh, eight died because of COVID. So therefore, uh, Seven is not the majority of uh, eight, so there being no majority, the remaining directors cannot uh, fill the vacancy. Now, the second, the emergency action is required to prevent grave, substantial, irreparable loss, damage to the corporation. Third, the vacancy may be temporarily filled from among the officers of the corporation. So the options are limited, right? It's not the board cannot appoint anyone else. The board has to appoint from among the officers of the corporation. And unanimity, unanimous vote among the remaining directors of the corporation. And the term of this emergency director, of course, is not uh, the same as the term of a replacement director. A replacement director, meaning one who uh, is appointed to replace a resigned director, will serve the unexpired portion of the term of the resigned director, right? But not in the case of an emergency director, All right? What, what is the action? Uh, what is the term rather of uh, that designated director? The action by that designated director or emergency director may put it for trustees shall be limited to the emergency action necessary. And the terms shall cease with a reasonable time from the termination of the emergency or the appointment of replacement shall become early. Now, this is red font, uh, for reason I've explained in a short while. Are directors, trustees, and officers liable for action taken on behalf of the corporation? But we all know the answer. Uh, general rule, they're not liable for the action taken on behalf of the corporation. A corporation being a juridical person cannot act except through agents, right? And the agents are the directors, officers, or other agents of the corporation, meaning not directors, not officers. So therefore, if a corporate director officer acts on behalf of the corporation, it is theoretically the act of the corporation to the directors, officers, and agents, not the personal, not the official act of the directors, representatives, agents, or officers of the corporation. And that's why the rule is any action taken by the director, officer, or agent on behalf of the corporation is the act of the corporation. 
That's why they are not liable for any obligation taken on behalf of the corporation. But there are exceptions. Next. There are exceptions, you all know. Uh, one of the exceptions, um, oftentimes asked in the bar, but included in our discussion because of a case spent by Justice Marvick, or you may say uh, two cases spent by Justice Marvick Leonin. Uh, what are those cases where director, officer, or agent may be held liable uh, with the corporation? Meaning, despite the fact that they acted on behalf of the corporation, they can be personally liable for the obligations, likewise, of the corporation. So these are the, these are the following, as you all know. Uh, knowingly voting for a scientific the patent the law of the act, gross negligence or bad faith conducting the affairs of the corporation, acquiring a personal or um, uh, pecuniary or personal interest in conflict with duty as director or officer that results in damage to the corporation, fourth, consent to issuance of other stocks or knowing such issuance do not interpose objection thereto, and fifth, if I express Provision of law is made to answer for a corporate act or remission. And the sixth one, if he agrees to make himself liable with the corporation. Thanks. Now, these are the cases that I was referring to. There are three, not just two. All of them penned by Justice Margaret Donald. So, BF Corporation uh, filed a correction complaint against uh, Shangila Properties. Shangila Properties for the owner of Shangila Malls and Shangila Hotels in the Philippines. So BF Corporation constructed uh, the Shangri-La Mall in Mandaluyong. And uh, BF Corporation uh, constructed, was able to finish the construction of the mall, uh, even though at that point it was not fully paid. So it finished the construction based on the representation, assurance, guarantee, right? Basically by Shangri-La Properties that they have the funds to pay off uh, BF Corporation. And the delay in payment was simply because of the rate processing of the uh, statement of accounts by the contractor BF Corporation. And because Shangri-La took possession of, uh, of course, the, the, the mall without BF being paid, so BF filed an action for collection against Shangri-La and its directors, right? The first question, are the directors of Shangri-La liable for the obligation of Shangri-La properties? The answer is no. As you out a while ago. Right. Uh, there is no showing of bad faith or gross negligence, no showing that any of those six cases we enumerated existed. Right. Next. Now, uh, next potential question, uh, arbitration, remedial law, if not commercial law, can the directors be compelled to participate in the arbitration proceeding? So there is an arbitration clause in the agreement between Shangri-La and, uh, and uh, BF uh, Corporation that neither party can go to court without first exhausting the arbitration procedures in the arbitration agreement. Now, obviously, obviously the parties to arbitration agreement are only Shangri-La and uh, BF, right? Not the directors of Shangri-La properties. So therefore, can they be compared to participate in arbitration? Now, the Supreme Court, Justice Marvick Jones said, because the complaint against Shangila properties and the directors alleged a bad faith or gross negligence, it is basically an attempt to pierce the veil of corporate fiction. If it established that there was gross negligence or bad faith in conducting the affairs of the corporation on the part of uh, uh, the director of Shangila, Lanusha et al., no? then the corporation and directors become one the same entity. What is true for the corporation becomes true for the stock for the directors. If the corporation is required to uh, participate in arbitration, so with the directors of the corporation. Okay, so that's the effect when you allege bad faith or gross negligence. It's an attempt, according to Justice Marvick, to pierce the bail of corporate fiction. Now, there's no need, of course, uh, to pierce the bail because uh, it was the ruling of the court that the directors did not perform any act indicative of bad faith or gross negligence on behalf of Shangila. They're only agents or representatives of, of Shangila. It's not the obligation, it's the obligation of Shangila, the obligation of the representatives of the corporation. Thanks. Thanks. 
Okay, uh, this is a case, of course, another, by, another case penned by Judge Marvick. Internet to sign a TR agreement on behalf of the Entrustic Operation. TR, of course, not part of the bar, obviously. But can the director who signed a TR agreement on behalf of the corporation be made liable civilly in case the corporation violated the trust of CTO? And the Supreme Court said, no, unless that director assumes personal liability. Now, we all know that uh, he can be held liable criminally, right? Uh, under Section 13 of PD-105, that says that the offender is a corporation, criminal liability should be imposed upon the director, officer, agent responsible for the violation. But the law does not make him liable civilly, right? It's the obligation, civil obligation of the corporation, not the civil obligation of the director who signed the TR agreement. Unless that director who signed the TR agreement assumes personal liability, as when he executed the short agreement or guarantee agreement to bind himself with the corporation. Next. Now, this is a third case uh, penned by Justice Marvick Lonen. That's why it's included in our discussion. As I said, uh, the case of Pioneer Insurance you know, versus Morningstar. So you have this association, International Air Transport Association, uh, basically, uh, composed of travel agents, likewise, Morningstar is a travel agent. So, any travel agent, of course, sells tickets, airline tickets on behalf of airline companies. And uh, the remittances from those sales are made to uh, Ayata. Ayata, in turn, will, of course, process the payment and remit the same, likewise, to uh, the airline companies that sold the various tickets through the different travel agents. Now, in this case, uh, Morningstar was not able to remit Toyota certain collections, among the millions of pesos. So, Ayata uh, is secured by a bond issued by Pioneer. So, if any of these sub agents fails to remit, then uh, Ayata can draw on the bond issued by uh, Pioneer. So, Ayata collected from uh, Pioneer. Pioneer paid Ayata, and of course, after payment is subrogated to the rights of Ayata and filed the actual collection against Morningstar in this case. That's why it's Morningstar versus uh, Pioneer versus Morningstar. Now, the issue in this case, and this is relevant to our discussion, is whether or not the directors and officers of Morningstar may be held liable for the unpaid remittances of the travel agency to the Ayata. And uh, why? B because when they incurred the obligation with, uh, with Ayata, they were already incurring huge losses. They were already incurring huge losses. So, if you say, if you have huge losses, you can not enter the contract, basically. It's not indicative of bad faith just because incurring huge losses, uh, you still in continue uh, transacting business is that negative of bad faith? Excellent. Next. And this is what the Supreme Court said, Judge Marvick Leonard, of course, reiterating what we uh, mentioned a while ago. There are six cases to make them, uh, to make the directors liable with the corporation. Now, none of these six cases obtained in this case. Uh, the mere fact that Morningstar has been incurring huge losses and no assets at the time contracted large financial obligation, Toyota, are not dictated of bad faith. So that's why they were not made liable. Next. Next. All right. Now, in relation, likewise, to the powers, duties of the board, I mean, on the same topic, there are two cases penned by Justice Marvick. Now, this time, uh, there is no board resolution, right? There's no board resolution in these cases. But despite the lack of board resolution, the ruling of the Supreme Court in both cases, well, uh, I would say the ruling the first and so the second, uh, both require discussion of the document of apparent authority. 
Except that for the first case, the Supreme Court didn't apply it in favor of the corporation. For the second case, it applied against the corporation. Okay, let's take a look at the first case, Recursion versus Kaluban. So first, let's establish the premise. Uh, we all know, general rule, if the action or transaction or contract not approved by the board, it's not binding to the corporation. These corporate powers are exercised by the board of directors, right? One of the exceptions, if the bylaws authorize the officer or director to act on behalf of the corporation. Third, even though there is no provision in the bylaws, there is no board resolution, if the corporation cloth, right, the officer with the power authority that led third party to believe he is authorized to transact business on behalf of the corporation. The doctrine of apparent authority. The first case. So basically, uh, the borrower corporation obtained a loan from the lender secured by a mortgage on the property of the corporation. So the loan was received by the borrower corporation. Some payments were made, in fact, uh, by the president uh, in favor of the lender corporation. But for the, the loan in full was not paid. At a certain point, the borrower corporation defaulted. So the lender foreclosed the mortgage, right? Now, after foreclosure of the mortgage with the, the lender winning in the auction sale, the borrower fired the president and repudiated the contract entered into by the president on behalf of the borrower corporation. So basically, the complaint was an argument of uh, the foreclosure and the sale. And it claimed that uh, the president of the borrower corporation was never authorized to obtain loan or use the property as collateral. Okay. Next. And the Supreme Court to Judge Marvick on this question was respondent, uh, meaning the borrower is stopped from denying the authority of the president. And he answered in the affirmative. The borrower is stopped from denying the authority of the former president based on docking up apparent authority. So the, uh, the borrower gave the president the scope of authority to act on his behalf. Uh, the corporation, the borrower received checks to the president. The title of the property delivered by the president to the borrower. And the title could only have come from the uh, borrower corporation, right? So the title was delivered to the lender. And that can only happen if the borrower, of course, entrusted the title with the uh, president of the corporation. All checks received by... Uh, by the borrower from the lender, like was cleared, right? And all of those actions taken by the president on behalf of the borrower corporation. So even though there is no border solution, corporation bound by the action taken by its president on the ground of docking of a final authority. Next. Now, the last case on docking of a final authority penned by Josh Marvick, the case of Turk Construction versus Bank of Filipino. So basically, Turk Construction uh, plan to develop a housing project. To finance the uh, construction development of the housing project, it issued bonds. Bonds are borrowings of the corporation, right? So total worth or total amount of bonds, let's say 400 billion pesos, it's called Margarita Project uh, Bond. The Bank of Filipino purchased Margarita bonds, 400 million. Now, it asked for payment of interest higher than the quoted or stipulated interest on the bond. The interest on the bond indicates 8.5. So Bank of Philippines, of course, uh, agreed to invest, but uh, asked that it be paid higher than 8.5. And the uh, the president, no, the SBP rather, of uh, Turk Construction, communicated to Bank of Filipino, we need to pay interest higher than 8.5. So Turk began the construction of the uh, pro project but because of the crisis in 1997, was not able to finish it. Next. So what happens now to those bonds? They matured. And the funds were insufficient to pay the bondholders. So the question now is, can a Banco Filipino demand for the same payment of interest that it was accustomed to receiving from the SBP of Turk Construction acting on behalf of Turk Construction. 
So Turbo Strong refused to pay, claiming that the SBB had no authority to offer interest higher than 8.5. And just Marvick Leonen for the Supreme Court applied the document upon authority and held that the corporation, meaning uh, term construction, bound by the action taken by its SPP. So the defense of insurance payment, of course, cannot stand. Uh, the uh, well, Bank of Filipino um, received payments twice, right? So if it is true that SB was never authorized, at the very outset, therefore, it should have been repudiated by by uh, term construction. But it was only repudiated when the corporation is already unable to pay its obligation. Next. Okay. On uh, powers, duties, prerogatives of stockholder, uh, of course, you all know that there are different rights available to stockholders of the corporation. Next. We have proprietary right, receive dividends, participate in assets upon dissolution, regulation, the corporation. Next. Uh, management rights, or the right to approve corporate acts requiring stockholders approval, the right to elect directors of the corporation. You have remedial rights, appraisal, preemptive, right to inspect, right to file derivative suit. Now, of the management rights, next slide. Uh, we will not be discussing uh, all of these rights, of course, so, uh, consistent with the parameters we defined a while ago. On management right, the right to vote on government acts requiring stockholders of Google. I decided to include uh, this point in our discussion because of an end bank decision, the business enterprise transfer rule. In the case of uh, YI Leisure versus, well, James Hugh versus YI Leisure, 2015. Next. Now, of course, there are two kinds of sale, encumbrance of real property or assets of the corporation. Uh, sale in the ordinary course of business, it only requires uh, board approval by majority of the quorum at least. And sale, encumbrance, disposition of all or substantially all of the uh, assets and business of the corporation. Now, you all know, of course, if the sale is an ordinary course of business, as we said, majority uh, of the quorum suffices, but if the sale of uh, or substantial board approval by majority vote and stockholders by two thirds, at least about standing company stock. Next. 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 Now, we have the nail doctrine. For the nail doctrine, you remember, uh, this was already asked in the bar, but the rule is that the buyer corporation not liable to assume and pay the obligation of the seller corporation, right? Sale of properties is not the same as murder. In a merger, as you all know, the surviving corporation will be liable for the obligation of the uh, hard corporation as it directly incurred by the surviving corporation. Murder, of course, not part of the bar, given the reduced syllabus. But this one can be can be can be uh, included, as if we're discussing it now. Um, what are the exceptions? So you have the general rule that a buyer corporation not liable for the obligation of the seller corporation. There are four exceptions. You all know under the Nell doctrine. The first exception by stipulation when the buyer assumes the obligation of the seller corporation. Second, if the sale amounts to murder consolidation. Third, if the sale is made in bad faith. And fourth, the so-called business enterprise transfer rule. When the uh, buyer continues with the personality and the business, well, not the personality, but if the buyer continues with the business of the seller corporation. The Supreme Court said that fraud is not an element of the business enterprise transfer rule. It's an element of the third exception, sale made in bad faith, but not an element of the business enterprise transfer rule. What does it mean? If the buyer corporation acquires the assets and the business of the seller corporation, then the buyer corporation is liable for the obligation of the seller corporation. So for buying some purposes, therefore, uh, take a look at what's being sold. If what is being conveyed and disposed of are only the assets, all or substantially all, 
not the business, did the buyer corporation not liable for obligation of the seller. But if what the buyer acquired is not just the assets, all substantially all, but like with the business of the seller, did the buyer corporation under the business enterprise transfer rule we will assume the obligations of the seller corporation. Next. Next. Right. Okay. Um, modes of voting in stockholders and members meeting in under the RCC. Uh, again, given the power duties of uh, prerogatives of stockholders and uh, in relation to uh, the management, right? Okay. So, how can they participate in those meetings where corporate acts had to be approved by the stockholders under the revised cooperation code. Now, it can be a potential bar exam question because you all know the RCC liberalized modes of attendance during stockholders meeting. Before, they're only in person or by proxy or to a trust, uh, boarding trust agreement, right? Now, the stockholder can vote in absentia, right? Or remote communication. He can send his, his vote to text, right? He can participate through WeChat or whatever, um, but subject to the following. So what are the what are the different modes of voting, basically? Other than in person or proxy or uh, through a voting trust agreement. We have voting to remote communication or absentia, right? So therefore, when is voting by remote communication or an absentia be considered valid? Number one, if it's authorized by the bylaws of the corporation. Second, if it's not authorized by the bylaws of the corporation, if the corporation involved is impressed with public interest. And third, even though it's not in the bylaws, even though it's not a corporation impressed with public interest, the board of directors by majority thereof, I mean majority of total number of board of directors, approve this kind of voting. But if they approve this mode of voting, they have to specify, spell out the mechanics by which the stockholders can participate in remote communication or in absentia. So bylaws, right? Or even though not in the bylaws, for cooperation, in public interest. And third, by the majority vote of the board of directors, but prescribing the guidelines, no? on how to vote to remote communication or in absentia. Next. 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 Appraiser right now, I'm, I'm including this in our discussion because just because of one case. That is yet to be asked in the bar, but well, um, it's a perfect example of uh, when to apply appraiser, right? First, what is appraisal right? We all know it's the right of the stockholder to demand the payment of the fair value of his shares after the sending from a proposed corporate act in the cases provided by law. So simply put, it is the right to get out of the corporation and uh, of course get back likewise his equity investment. Next. 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 So this is a case I am referring to, um, Turner versus the Rancho Shipping Corporation. So the corporation proposed the amendment of the articles of incorporation to deny the stockholders preemptive right. Now, one of the stockholders were not in favor of the amendment and after the meeting they demanded the payment of the fair value of the shares. All right. When he made demand for payment of the fair value of the shares, the corporation at that point had no surplus profit. Okay. First question, is the exercise of appraisal right as a result of the amendment to the articles of the corporation denying preemptive rights proper? Is it one of those cases where appraisal right can be exercised? The answer is yes, right? Because the amendment is to deny the stockholders right to preemption. So they have no right to subscribe to new shares of the corporation. And what happens if you have no right to subscribe to new shares of the corporation? You can be diluted 
your interest, your stake, your right to receive dividends, your right to participate in the management of the corporation, the right to get the assets upon the solution regulation, of course, uh, will be diluted correspondingly because new shares can be offered uh, to, to non-stockholders or stockholders except you, right? All right, so is this amendment one of those cases where a price right is allowed? And the answer is yes, because one of those amendments where a price right may be exercised is amendment the articles of the corporation. That has the effect of changing or restricting rights of stockholders or any shares of any class. So denying preemptive right is a restriction on your right as stockholder and on your shares. Next question, however, is even though it can be invoked, as one of the cases proper for appraisal right, is X the stockholder entitled to the payment? The Supreme Court said no, because at the time he made the demand for payment, there was no surplus profit. So it's very important that when you make a surplus profit, uh, when you make a demand for payment, rather, there is surplus profit. If there is none, you have to wait for the availability of surplus profit. Once available, make a demand for payment. If refused, then you can file a case against the corporation. Next. 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 Okay, this one is on red. Um, just in case, what will be asked a basic question, of course, um, on uh, on uh, preemptive right, you all know that preemptive right is not available for issuance of shares in exchange for property, right? Needed for corporate purpose if that is approved not just by the board, but by at least two thirds of the standing capital stock. So in this case, this is what happened. So the corporation uh, acquired a uh, property. Now the owner of the property would like to be paid not in cash, but in shares of stock. So the matter was approved by the board. The question is that sufficient and valid. Well, it's the action of the board, of course, is valid because all corporate acts have to be approved by the board, right? But not sufficient. Why not sufficient? Because the issuance of shares for property is subject to the following conditions. That property must be appraised, fairly valued, and approved by the SEC. So it's not the issuance of shares for that is approved or required for approval by the SEC, but the issuance of shares for property. That property must be fairly valued to prevent the issuance of watered stocks. So the SEC must first determine that the valuation is fair, right? Uh, before the shares can be issued in exchange for the property. And second important condition is that you need to get the vote of at least two thirds of those signing capital stock, right? Otherwise you will violate the preemptive right of the stockholders. Okay, right of inspection. Next. Okay, um, this is yet to be asked in the bar. So the stockholder's possession of a stock certificate required before he can exercise right of inspection. So let's say that the, he would like to access the books of the corporation, would like to inspect corporate records, but he has no stock certificate and the corset requires the presentation, otherwise the right will be denied. The Supreme Court said it's not a requirement. So you can exercise your right of inspection even though you have no stock certificate, as long as you are a stockholder of the corporation. When are you issued a stock certificate? Only if you're fully paid your subscription, right? And partial payment of subscription is allowed. But the stock certificate only issued upon full payment of the subscription. In the meantime, you have no stock certificate. What happens to you as a stockholder? Well, the law says that holders of unpaid shares that are not delinquent have all the rights of a stockholder. Those rights include right of inspection. Next. Now, the, I included this part only for one purpose. Uh, no, I think we'll, we'll uh, correlate this with another slide later. Okay, next. An action to, to recover possession of a stock in transfer book from the former corset of the corporation not enforceable criminally, right? Under the revised uh, uh, corporation code or even under the old code. 
Why? Because the right of inspection can be violated only by the corporation acting through its incumbent responsible directors, officers, and agents. A former corsair, right, is no longer acting on behalf of the corporation, so he can never be charged with criminal violation of right of inspection. So an action to recover possession is enforceable civilly, not criminally under the revised cooperation. Next. Okay, this is a case penned by Judge Marvick, not mistaken. Uh, or a 2009, 2009 decision. No, it's not. 2009 decision, but we didn't cut off date. Uh, and it's very interesting, and that's why I included in our discussion, is the filing of an action for injunction, the appropriate remedy available to the corporation to enjoin a stockholder from exercising right of inspection. And the Supreme said, no. Okay? If you notice, you know, in those slides, uh, or is it in the next slide anyway? So the remedy available to the corporation is to deny the right of inspection if the request is done contrary to law. Meaning that being done in a manner that is not consistent with what the law provides. That's a remedy. Deny it. If there is a reason to deny it. And not to file an action for injunction to restrain the right of inspection. Because of uh, letter F and letter G, we all know right of inspection is not absolute, subject to certain limitations, uh, does not extend to trade secrets and proprietary information like a formula for chemicals, right? Um, and letter G, in relation to our discussion a while ago, that the bylaws may disqualify a competitor from being elected as director of the corporation, right? Now, under RCC, a stockholder may be denied right of inspection if he is a competitor or he represents interest adverse to the corporation. So it need not be in the bylaws, right? So as long as you're a competitor, you are an interest adverse to the corporation, established, of course, by the corporation, then you can be denied, likewise, access to the records of the corporation, even though you're, you're a stockholder of the corporation. Next. Uh, also keep in mind that inspection is extinguished by dissolution of the corporation because uh, um, whatever rights or remedies available to the corporation or stockholders shall not be impaired on account of dissolution. Another right of uh, the stockholders, which I decided to include in our presentation, uh, given that uh, Justice Leonen has a case on, on this uh, matter, right to file suits. So first of what are the individual rights available to stockholders aggrieved by the wrongful acts of the board of directors and officers of the corporation who uh, occupy the same management. And here there are three kinds of suits and remedies, individual suit, representative, representative suit, and derivative suit. Individual suit, we all know, of course, uh, if the aggrieved party is a stockholder, let's say denied right of inspection, denied right of preemption, then he files individual suit. If uh, the remedy or the harm rather is committed against a group or class of stockholders, they can file representative suit. So in case of uh, en masse denial, let's say preemptive right, stockholders who are similarly situated may file that kind of suit. And the third one, of course, derivative suit. Derivative suit. Okay, first, what is derivative suit? So we all know it's an action filed by the stockholder on behalf and the name of the corporation to enforce a corporate right or a cause of action to set aside or nullify the wrong acts committed by the directors and officers in charge of the corporation. So uh, it's a suit filed by a stockholder on behalf of the corporation. The great party all know is the corporation the harm is committed by those directors and officers in charge of the management of the corporation. And because they're the ones in charge of the management of the corporation, uh, they're not expected not to rectify the very wrongful acts they committed against the corporation. So therefore, a stockholder on behalf of the corporation may take the appropriate action to set aside those wrongful acts 
and avoid the harm or address the harm committed against the corporation. The stockholder will take the cudgels for the corporation to set aside these wrongful acts because these acts harm the corporation and the whole body of stockholders. Next. Next. Okay, next. Elements of derivative suit. Okay, uh, let's review our uh, basic concept. Enumeration may not be part of the bar, but enumeration is important for us to answer potential bar exam question that calls for resolution of issue and application, of course, of the law to the facts. And they may involve, let's say, uh, recall of the elements of derivative suit. One of the elements of derivative suit, of course, to refresh the memory, our keyword is CSEN, right? C stands for uh, corporate right or cause of action. So it is filed by a stockholder in the name or on behalf of the corporation to enforce a corporate right or cause of action. S stands for stockholder, right? The plaintiff must be a stockholder when the sanctions occurred and when he filed the complaint. And then E stands for exhaustion of intra-corporate remedies to obtain the relief he desires under the articles of the corporation, the bylaws and rules and regulations of the corporation. So if the corporation has uh, those remedies, intra-corporate remedies, uh, then you have to exhaust those remedies first before you can file the remedy suit. And you have to allege particularity. Therefore, it's exerted to uh, exhaust uh, intercorporate remedies. And N stands for not a nuisance or harassment suit, and A, appraisal right not available. Next. 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 One of the two cases penned by Justice Marvick on derivative suit. Uh, the first one, uh, Villamore versus Omale. So in this case, a corporation, Pacific, Pacific Printing Corporation, obtained an option to lease a prime property in Ortigas. It's the Ortigas Home Depot. Now, the board directors of the corporation issued a resolution assigning without any consideration its right and interest in that lease option in favor of Villamor, attorney Villamor. So instead of uh, the corporation right, being the one leasing the property and get the rentals, it assigned the same in favor of uh, Villamor. Now, PPC represented by Villamor entered an agreement with MC Home Depot, allowing MC Home Depot to continue occupying the lease property in exchange for payment of rentals and goodwill money. The rental was about 4.5 million pesos and goodwill was about 18 million pesos. So MC Home Depot, pursuant to the agreement, issued uh, post daily checks to cover those uh, rental payments and goodwill money. Now, Villamor, uh, upon encastment of these checks, did not turn them over to the corporation. So Balmores demanded from the corporation to require that Villamor turn over the check payments or pay their equivalent value. Operation refused. So Balmore is now filing action against Villamor. And they are the other members of the board citing fraudulent device or scheme amounting to fraud or misrepresentation. Now, the issue relevant to discussion, but well, there are many issues here, but the one relevant to discussion is May the complaint be characterized as a derivative suit? The CA ruled that the complaint can be could be characterized as a derivative suit. So, is the characterization of the complaint as a derivative suit correct? And the Supreme Court Judge Marvick Leonen said no. Why? Because it lacks the elements of derivative suit. They were not alleged in the complaint, right? And not present. So which element in particular is starkly absent in a complaint filed in this case? The element that the suit must be filed by the stockholder on behalf right, of the corporation in the name of the corporation to enforce a corporate right or cause of action. In this case, it was never filed by Balmore on behalf of the corporation. It was filed by Balmore against the uh, uh, Villamor and the other directors of the corporation who perform what they call to be fraudulent acts and devices scheme 
that harm uh, the board, stockholders, members of the corporation. While it is conceded, uh, there are four elements here, right? The fifth element is at present, you may have noticed. But in our previous slide, you notice that there's a fifth element. And that fifth element, in fact, the first element, as Supreme Court said in those cases, cases I cited, uh, the first element is implied in every delivery pursuit. What is that first element? The element that the complaint must be filed in the name of and in behalf of the corporation. This case was never filed on behalf of the corporation. He was suing for himself, right? Not for the corporation. And second, uh, the, the non inclusion of the corporation is a part in the case. It's very important in the derivative suit that the corporation be pleaded as a, as a nominal party. So, of course, the, the other thing that is fatal here, the non inclusion of the corporation right, in the suit. In a derivative suit, the real part interest is the corporation. And therefore, the non inclusion is fatal to the derivative cause of action. And without being pleaded, that complaint could not be properly characterized as a derivative suit. So, as the Supreme Court said, uh, Balmores was suing for his own personal interest, not on behalf of the corporation. And second, of course, there are different kinds of uh, intercorporate controversy. It is completely indicated. It's not about derivative suit, but fraud and device to scheme perpetrated by directors and associates that harm uh, corporation and its directors and officers. Next. Okay, uh, the other case, Pema Justice Marvick, uh, Florete versus Florete. This involves uh, People's Broadcasting Corporation. It's a private corporation authorized to operate, uh, own, maintain, install, and construct radio and TV station. Uh, you should be the owner of uh, PDB4. So when uh, the patriarch of People's Broadcasting Service Company, the, the father of Marcelino and Rogelio, so Marcelino and Rogelio are brothers. So when your father died, of course, uh, management of the corporation entrusted to uh, Rogelio. So Rogelio made certain transfers of shares of stock in favor of his group. And uh, thereafter, he subscribed to issue ones of shares of the corporation, resulting in a more uneven balance. No? In the sense that he got more shares than his brother Marcelino. So Marcelino filed an action, as we said, to nullify those share transfers, the issuance of shares taken from the subscribed portion of the authorized company stock, citing various violations of the corporation code. Right? Now keep in mind, it's a suit filed by Forete Group versus Rogelio Group. The objective is to reconfigure the capital structure of the corporation. So by nullifying those transfers, those subscriptions, in effect, Marcelino Group wants to reconfigure the capital structure of the corporation. Okay. So was it proper for the RTC, as the RTC dismissed this case, was it proper for the RTC to dismiss the complaint by the Marcelino Group on the ground of an inclusion of the cooperation in the complaint. And this is what Judge Marvick Jones said. The dismissal is proper. So if the objective of the suit is to configure the capital structure of the cooperation, as in this case, it's a remedy available to the cooperation. Right? The harm is against the cooperation and the whole body of stockholders. The harm is not so much on the plaintiff, but on the corporation and the whole body of stockholders. It is a cause of action for the corporation to pursue. Next, next. Can you back up, please? So this is what the Supreme Court uh, concluded. Erroneously pursuing a derivative suit as a class suit not only meant that Marcino Group lacked a cause of action, it also meant they failed to plead the cooperation, which is fatal to every derivative suit. So to repeat, uh, just to be clear about it, 
if the uh, the harm is against their corporation and the whole body of stockholders, class suit is not the remedy. It should have been a remedy for the corporation. A stockholder for, should file a derivative suit on behalf of the corporation. So erroneously pursuing that kind of suit, derivative suit as a class suit, is fatal to the cost of action. It meant that the plaintiff had no cost of action, and of course, it also meant they failed to plead an indispensable party, non-inclusion of a corporation in the result, as we pointed out a while ago, is fatal to have a derivative cause of action. Next. 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 Okay, next. Okay, now, uh, still on the powers, duties of stockholders, you know, they can fill vacancy. If, uh, if the vacancy is brought about by expiration of term, removal, or increased number of board seats, or the ground is not any of those three, but the remaining director do not have a quorum, right? Now, I included this part, uh, who should fill vacancy due to resignation of a hold of the director because it has almost become a canonical doctrine, if not a canonical doctrine. And uh, uh, twice asked in the bar already. So the case of Bolivia versus Africa, the issue is whether or not the resignation of a hold over director may be filled by the remaining directors or should be filled by stockholders. In a meeting called for the purpose. And the Supreme Court said resignation of a hold over director, or this is a vacancy brought about by resignation of a hold over director, can only be filled by the stockholders, not by the board, even though the board, the main directors, constitute a quorum. Why? With a term of a hold over director has already expired. So the mode of vacancy is not resignation, but expiration of term. You all know the term of directors one year, right? Until their successor elected and qualified, one year the term, but they are allowed to occupy, continue being a director and hold over capacity if there is no quorum in the next Sabo's meeting or was simply failure to elect the replacement or um, successors of the incumbent directors. But it's important to say that the term has expired. The tenure may not be over. Tenure is the actual incumbency of the director, but the term has already expired. And because the grand expiration of term, it can only be filled by the stockholders, not by the board of directors. Next. Next. Now, the last topic on corporation law, okay, based on the new syllabus, articles of incorporation and bylaws. So what are the revisions on the RCC on provision articles of incorporation? But this is not likely to be asked. Uh, what I included this part because of next slide. Uh, number letter D. That is um, corporations organized under the RCC shall have perpetual existence unless the AOI provides otherwise. Right. Next slide. Sir. Now, and this is the the question I I I I thought is very important to include, uh, given the given my previous comment that there are two standout provisions of the RCC, so I find it difficult to ask a question cooperation without at least making reference to important provisions or revisions of the RCC in relation to an essay question that calls for a solution of issues, and this is the one to my mind. So given that. Corporations under the uh, RCC have perpetual existence unless their AOI provides otherwise. What about corporations organized prior to the effectivity of the revised corporation law? Now, under Section 11 of the RCC, as you all know, corporations organized prior to the effectivity of the corporation law shall have perpetual existence, right? Unless the stockholders, by the vote of this majority of the standing company stock, elect to return, retain their specific term and communicate the same to the SEC, right? So therefore, is there a need 
to amend the articles of incorporation of all corporations organized prior to the effectivity of the RCC to reflect perpetual existence. And the answer is no. The express provision of law. There's an automatic conversion from fixed term to perpetual existence. And the period for the stockholders to elect to retain, retain their term had already expired. So the RCC has two year transitional period and that period expired last February 23, 2021. So it's, according to the SEC, the period for the stockholders to elect the tension of their specific term had expired last February 23, 2021. So therefore, two years from effectivity of the law, February 23, 2019. So therefore, for all intents and purposes, all corporations organized prior to the effectivity of the revised corporation code shall have perpetual existence. And the remedy available to stockholders in favor of the automatic conversion from uh, fixed to perpetual existence, they can exercise their appraisal right. Next. Well, if somebody asked me the question, uh, just in case, matanong. So given, given that the period to elect the tension of term uh, specified in AOI had expired last February 23, uh, 2021. Does it mean, therefore, that a stockholder can no longer demand the payment of the fair value of his shares? Now, what expired is just the retention, the, op the option to retain the term. That expired, as I said, uh, February 2021. But there's an equivalent law or similar law to the, to the effect that staff will cannot demand the payment of the fair value of the shares. So if this would be asked in the bar, the remedy is still, uh, the remedy in case the corporation uh, converts automatically, right, from uh, fixed to perpetual existence, the remedy is still one of operation, right? Next. Next. Okay, order this one. Uh, I included this because of the case penned by Judge Marvick. Are the powers of a corporation confined to what appears in the articles of the corporation? And the answer is no, right? Uh, the powers of the corporation, of course, are spelled out in the purpose clause of the AOI. But the powers are not limited to what appears in the AOI. The powers of the corporation extend to any act or transaction related to, in furtherance of, or germane to the purpose of the corporation. So that is the test. Is an action, transaction, contract, or activity related to, in furtherance of, germane to the purpose of the corporation? If the answer is yes, then it's allowed. Otherwise, it is ultra virus. Next. That is the case that I was referring to, the case of UM, University of Mindanao, right? Versus the Banco Central of the So, University of Mindanao is, of course, its education institution. And for the year 1982, the board was chaired by certain Guillermo Torres. His wife was their assistant uh, treasurer. So before 82, Torres and uh, his spouse put up a saving and loan association. First Iligan and the Bow Savings and Loan Association. So First Iligan Saving Loan Association obtained credit facility, emergency credit facility from Banco Central de Pilipinas, secured by a mortgage on the property owned by the school. The mortgage agreement was not signed by Guillermo Torres or his spouse. It was signed by the BB for Finance of um, University of Mindanao. Okay. So the loan was not paid, so BSP threatened to foreclose the mortgage. Okay. That's okay, so of course, uh, EM, University of Mindanao, uh, denied that the properties were mortgaged to BSP, denied having received any loan proceeds from BSP. So, University of Mindanao then filed two complaints to nullify and cancel the mortgage on the property of the school. 
Right. So the question basically is, is the school bound by the mortgage entered into by its vice president to secure the obligation of first saving loan association? So the, the CA, by the way, the RTC ruled in favor of uh, of the school, but it was reversed by the Court of Appeals. The CA ruled that although BSP failed to prove that the Board of Trustees of uh, UM actually passed a board resolution authorizing the BP, the mortgage, the Sabi property, that Corsair clothed uh, the BP with the power authority and BSP could rely in good faith on the secretary certificate. So this case went up to the Supreme Court and according to Judge Marvin John and UM is not bound by the rent entered into by, by um, its vice president. Okay, one, first reason, in relation to discussion with articles of the corporation, properties of the corporation can only be used to accomplish the purpose of the corporation. So therefore, the property of the school can be devoted only to attain the purpose of the school. So its property can be mortgaged, is it to secure the obligation incurred by the by, by the school and not by any other person. So that act is ultra business. Now, next point. What about the fact that the mortgage was annotated on the title of UM? Is it not equivalent to constructive notice against University of Mindanao? And just Marvin Jordan said that uh, liens annotated on the title no, are simply claims of interest. They have no bearing on whether or not the claim is valid or convert a defective claim into a valid one. Now, what about the document of apparent authority? Does it apply in this case? Because there is no board resolution, right? Uh, was there the application of doctrine of apparent authority. Did University of Mineral close the VP with the apparent authority that led BSP to believe is authorized to mortgage the property of the school? And just Marvick Jordan said, there was no act whatsoever in the part of UM that can be construed as ratification of the action taken by the vice president. And so simple, uh, simply put, UM not bound with the mortgage entered into by its vice president. Next. Next. Now on okay, of course, bylaws are like was included. Next, um, so there are two points uh, for our discussion concerning bylaws. Next, it's. Okay, this one. This is a canonical doctrine, right? Uh, are bylaws of the corporation binding on third parties? And of course, the answer is no, right? They're only binding on stockholders, members of the corporation, not to third party, non-stockholders, non-members, unless they have constructive knowledge of the bylaws provision at the time the contract or transaction was entered into. The case of China Bank versus Court of Appeals. You remember this case, it's canonical. Uh, doctrine, obviously, un undebatable, indebatable. So what happened in this case, you remember? Um, China Bank granted a loan to say to Wanderer Cruz secured by a pledge on the share of stock of Wanderer Cruz, the pledge or borrower issued by uh, Bali Golf and Gun Club. So because the loan was not paid, China Bank proposed a pledge and after foreclosure, went to uh, the Corsac of Bali Golf and Country Club. And uh, the Corsac of Bali Golf and Country Club refused to transfer ownership of the share in favor of China Bank, citing the provision in the bylaws of uh, Bali Golf and Country Club that it is a first lien on the share. And because the first lien on the share, uh, the dues and assessments owing to the corporation must first be paid. So the stockholder, the one obtained a loan from China Bank, hadn't paid dues and assessments. 
to Bali Golfing Country Club. So, of course, I refused because the corporation is the first lien on the share to cover and pay dues and assessments. So, they can be sold accordingly and apply the same in payment of the uh, unpaid dues and assessments. So, is this correct? Now, of course, Supreme Court said uh, the only reason, the only time that the corporation may refuse transfer of fully paid share is when it holds unpaid claim over the share. Unpaid claim means unpaid subscription and not any other obligation of the stockholder to the corporation. Right? Second important relation to our discussion, uh, that provision the bylaw is not binding in China Bank. Because China Bank is not a stockholder of Bali Global Economic Club. What about the fact that it learned about it after foreclosure? But the Supreme Court said it should have knowledge, should have had knowledge of the body's provision when the contract of loan and pledge was entered into, or were entered into, not after the fact, meaning not after foreclosure of the pledge. Next. Next. Okay. Now, I included this part because it is new. Uh, may the bylaws reflect the delegation of authority to the board to amend the bylaws? Now, you know that bylaws can be amended uh, by the vote of the board, at least majority, right? And stockholders owning at least majority of the Osana Gabriel stock, or the stockholders by two thirds of the Osana Gabriel stock delegate the authority to the board to amend the bylaws. So if the staff would delegate by two-thirds vote the power to amend the bylaws to the board, then the board alone can amend the bylaws. Now, where should the delegation of authority be embodied? Can the delegation be embodied in the bylaws of the corporation? And according to uh, the SEC, it's now part of the RCC, delegation of authority can only be made through a stockholder's solution, a member's solution for non-stock operation. It can be reflected in the bylaws. Uh, why? Because the power to amend the bylaws as delegated by the stockholders of the board can be withdrawn anytime, right? So the stockholders may revoke that power delegated to the board anytime. The majority of the assigned capital staff or majority of the members for non-stock operation. To include the same in the bylaws, I mean, delegation of authority would make it difficult for the stockholders to withdraw anytime delegated authority. Because if it's in the bylaws, they have to amend, right? The bylaws accordingly will have to pass uh, the proper resolutions, a board and stockholder solutions to be able to amend the bylaws. So that makes it inconsistent with the power of the stockholder to withdraw at any time, the power delegated to the board to amend the bylaws. Next. Okay, let's move on now to uh, intra-corporate disputes. Uh, the third item, the uh, second item rather, in the reduced syllabus of Josh Marvin Okay, next. So, uh, you all know that the Supreme Court issued rules on intra corporate controversy. And um, our, our keyword for died I, died device and scheme perpetrated by directors, associates, officers, partners, amount to fraud or misrepresentation that maybe the detrimental interest of the public and the corporation. And then I is intercorporate uh, dispute, E, election of directors and appointment of corporate officers, D, derivative suit, and I, inspection of corporate records, right? Now, uh, I don't think this should be asked in the bar because numeration, next slide. But I included Daddy Bakta. Okay, take a look at this uh, letter B. Controversies arising out of intracorporate partnership or association relations between and among stockholders, right? Members, associates, between and between any or all of them and the corporation, partnership, or association of which there are stockholders, members, or associates. I would like you to focus, I would like you to focus your attention on letter B, because this is the heart of intercorporate dispute, right? There are two tests. As we'll see later, the two tests determine if the dispute is intercorporate. The nature of the controversy test and the relationship test. Right. Now, on the first, the first relationship test, second nature of the controversy test. In the first test, 
it means that the dispute must be between the corporation and the stockholders or members or stockholders or members among themselves, right? Right? But in the cases that we will cite later, jurisprudence included a suit between the state and the corporation with respect to the right of the corporation to exist, with respect to its franchise, or a case between the corporation and the public. This is not consistent, right? <laughs> with this, with this, uh, with this, with that be. But anyway, I'm just pointing it out to you so that you will, will that will guide us in our discussion later on when we talk about the two tests to determine if the suit or dispute is in the corporate. Next. Next. Okay. When is dispute considered in the corporate in nature? You know, there are only five, right? Five uh, topics for uh, five major topics under corporation law. And of course, there, there, there are paragraphs for uh, two or three uh, major topics. So it's, it seems that uh, one will be taken you know, from any of those five topics. Very important. We got, we get it right. No? Um, so I, I surveyed, of course, I included what I think are the important cases on intercorporate uh, dispute. So as, as we said, there are two tests, right? Two tests. The first test is relationship test. And this occurs if the disputants, the parties of the case are the corporation and the stockholders or members, right? And the stockholders, members among themselves, right? Now, I said a while ago, the Supreme Court added with the corporation, uh, partnership, and the state, insofar as its right to exist concern, or between the public and the corporation, right? But most of all of the cases, in fact, that we will cite and decided by the Supreme Court, limit to dispute between the corporation and the stockholders and members, or stockholders and members among themselves. There is no case yet applying the intercorporate uh, uh, test to is a dispute between the corporation and the public, right? How can there be intercorporation between the corporation and the public or corporation and the state, right? So therefore, in your mind, it has to be a dispute between the corporation and the stockholders and members or dispute between or among stockholders and members among themselves. Okay. That is the first test. Second, next. Second is the nature of the controversy test. What do you mean? It means that the disagreement, of course, must be rooted in the existence of intercooperations. It must pertain to the enforcement of the rights and obligations under the cooperation code and the rules and regulations of the cooperation. Okay? So it has to pertain. It has to relate to the enforcement of the rights and obligations under the code and the rules and regulations of the corporation. Just because you have two stockholders, right, fighting each other, as it means in the corporate, if the dispute is not rooted or intercorporation, if it does not pertain to the enforcement of the rights and regulations under the code and the rules of the corporation, if they stuck it out in a fist, fist fight, it's not in the corporate, right, because of the lack or absence of the second element. Right. Next. Okay, let's take a look at your smoothness where the Supreme Court said the case is intercorporate in nature. A controversy between the condo corporation and its member units uh, for alleged and sound business practice in violation of the master deed of restriction and misrepresentation uh, of, of um, prospectus. Uh, basically, this is what happened. The representation is that there be, let's say, a world-class uh, Olympic size pool. But it's contrary to what was represented. So it is intercorporate because between the member and the condo corporation. Right. Now, where lies the jurisdiction for the RTC, not the HLRUB? HLRUB has jurisdiction over uh, disputes between some division, Hope Owners Association, and the members or the members of the subdivision association homeowners among themselves. Next. OK, 
Okay. Now, this one. Uh, what about if it is a sequestered corporation? But the issue is right of inspection. So a stockholder of a sequestered corporation denied right of inspection. Is it Sandigan Bayan that has jurisdiction or the or the, um, the RTC? Is it intercorporate in nature? And the Supreme Court said yes, even though uh, it, they, they refer to sequestered corporation. Why? Because two tests are present. The first relationship test between the corporation and the stockholder, and second, meeting the controversy is about the right of inspection. Next. Now, this one was Ashley Bart, 2014, the case of uh, Medical Plaza, Makati Medical Plaza Condominium. Uh, what happened in this case? So, DC used to be the former president and unit owner of uh, a corporation. It's anyway, Makati Plaza, Medical Plaza Condo Corporation. So, in one uh, meeting to elect the directors of the corporation. He was not allowed to be present because accordingly, he did not pay his association dues. So for the, the former president, um, denied the claim saying that he paid all of his dues. In fact, he was elected president of the corporation. Now, the quality corporation on the other hand claimed that what was not paid were the conduit dues obligations from the former developer, right? Meaning the, the predecessor interest of Makati Medical Plaza on the corporation. So there's a dispute there for whether or not he did not or he paid his dues and assessments to the corporation. That's why he was not allowed to vote. So he filed the complaint for damages before the uh, Special Commercial Court of Pasig, Makati in that case. The motion dismissed filed by the corporation on the ground that it has no, the court has no jurisdiction what has jurisdiction is the HLRUB. Okay. So is, who is correct? The condo corporation or the unit owner, former president denied his right to vote. Next. So the Supreme Court said, so every time the dispute is between the condo corporation and its member or stockholder, and it relates to the payment of dues and assessments is intercorporate in nature. So keep that in mind. So the first test present, relationship test, on the corporation member, second test, anything about unpaid dues and assessments is intercorporate in nature. If they to concur, it is an intercorporate dispute recognizable by the RTC. HLRUB has no jurisdiction over condo corporation. As we said a while ago, is jurisdiction between is jurisdiction on intercorporate dispute between the subdivision home owners association and the members or the members of the association among themselves. Next. Next. What about jurisprudence where the Supreme Court ruled that the matters are intercorporate in nature. Uh, determination as to who is the true owner of a property entitled to the income is generated is civil in nature. So the conflict among the parties outside the jurisdiction of the special commercial court. This one, uh, good versus Jetta, very funny. A complaint for damages uh, filed by, well, interesting and funny, filed by a member of uh, the subdivision homeowners association for the harm he suffered when another member can you imagine? Close a portion of the plaintiff's drainage pipe that led overflowing of the septic tank. So they were they were uh, neighbors. No? A duplex created in a subdivision in I think Kaita Rizal. So one morning, so one of the members uh, well smelled something filthy. It turned out that his uh, uh, septic tank had overflowed. Had overflowed. Overflowed. So he thought na punulang, barado lang. So he decided to engage Malapanan for suction services. But despite of that, or I mean, because of that, they discovered that a portion of the pipe, drainage pipe that led to the subdivision's drainage pipe, cut off. 
So he suspected that could not be done by his neighbor. So he filed a complaint for damages, RPC, and the defendant moved to dismiss on the ground that is intercorporate in nature. Supreme Court said not intercorporate, right? Because of the element of what? The elements, the second element, not present. It's not rooted on intercorporation. It has nothing to do with the enforcement of the rights and obligations under the corporation code and the rules and regulations of the corporation. Next. Now, what about uh, election contest in the context of intercorporate controversy? Uh, well, election contest, of course, refers to any controversy or dispute involving title or claim to any elective office in stock or non-stock operation, validation of proxies, manner and uh, validity of elections, qualification of candidates, including proclamation of winners. Now, therefore, if, um, if a person wants to identify the results, a stockholder wants to identify the results of the election, on the ground that she was not notified of the stockholders meeting, but he's not aspiring or she's not aspiring for a director position, is that an election contest in the context of the rules on intercorporate controversy? And the Supreme Court said, yes, election contest broad enough to include any action to question the validity of elections. You don't have to be the one aspiring for the other position. If you're questioning the results of the election, question its legality and validity, it is one of election contest and therefore covered by a certain uh, time to file it. Next. Next. Okay, this one, uh, the case is penned by Judge Marvick. We, uh, that's why it's in our lecture again, in our presentation. The test will determine if the removal of an officer is a labor dispute or intercorporate controversy. What's the test? All right. So just keep this in mind. The officer to be removed must be a corporate officer, right? To fall with the jurisdiction of the RTC. So removal of a corporate officer is an intra-corporate dispute cognizable by the RTC. Removal of an ordinary officer, not a corporate officer, is a labor dispute cognizable by the labor arbiter. Now, what makes you a corporate officer? Either you are appointed or occupying a position under a statute, or your position is specified in the bylaws of the corporation. Then you're elected by the stockholders or the board of directors. Okay, so repeat, you're holding on to a position prescribed by statute, president, secretary, treasurer. And we can now add compliance officer under the revised corporation board. Right. Second, even though you're not holding a position prescribed by statute, you're holding to a position specified or found in the bylaws of the corporation. Now, second, you're appointed by the stockholders or the board of directors. Now, of course, the part to appoint is with the board, right? So the board theoretically appoints the corporate officers. But that doesn't mean that you're a corporate officer. If you're not holding on to a bylaws position or a position prescribed by statute. Okay. Now, what happens if you're not? I mean, what happens if these elements are not present? You're not holding on to a, uh, a statute position or bylaws position, then you are not a corporate officer. It's not that you don't matter, right? Uh, it's not a question of importance of the corporation. It's a question of either corporate dispute or labor dispute. So if you're not a corporate officer, then your removal is a labor dispute cognizable by the labor arbiter. Next. Okay, we stay in verse Maglaya. Uh, it's in the next slide. Uh, but anyway, it's already on this uh, particular slide. In this case, Maglaya was former president of his day. And he, uh, he was supposed to have a term. And before his term could expire, he was removed by the, uh, by the school. So where should he go? Labor arbiter or artist? 
So the contention of Mr. Yan is that he is an employee of the corporation. He wears the ID issued by the corporation. He's in the payroll of the corporation. He's part, he's governed by the rules and regulations of the, of, of the school. So therefore, he is an employee even though he's a president. So is that correct? And the Supreme Court said, well, just because he's in the payroll, <laughs> who is not in the payroll anyway, just because you're, you're, he's in the payroll, he's issued ID by, by the school, and he's governed by the policy of the school, doesn't mean that he's not a corporate officer. He's a corporate officer because he is occupying a position prescribed by statute. All corporations must have president, right? Secretary and Director. And because he's holding on to a position prescribed by statute, he's a corporate officer. His removal is an intra-corporate dispute, not a labor dispute. Next. Next. Okay, I think this is the red, red font, right, sir? Now, yes, keep in sir. mind that um, the board can delegate the the power to create a corporate office to the president. Now, next slide, sir. Related to B. Okay, what, what about if the bylaws authorizes the board to create a corporate office? Okay, so pursuant to that authority granted by the bylaws, the board created, let's say, the office of uh, vice president for legal affairs and appointed the person, the lawyer, to occupy the position. Thereafter, he was removed, right? Where should he go? RTC or labor arbiter? In according to the Supreme Court, labor arbiter, it's not intercorporate dispute. Why? Because the board has no power to create a corporate office, even though it was negated by the bylaws of the corporation. What is the correct remedy, therefore? The correct remedy is to amend the bylaws, amend the bylaws, and make this office created by the board as a corporate office. In which case, the holder of that office, now a corporate officer, his removal now becomes an intercorporate dispute. Next. Next. Okay, this one is penned by Josh Marvick, the Charlie Bruce Bradford. Next. Next. Okay, enter the month, tell the backdrop. So, under the bylaws, yung VP, VP, no? a corporate office. E ang kanyang position, executive vice president. So, hindi vice president lang, but executive vice president, no? So, sabi ng Supreme Court, with more reason, that is considered a corporate office. Officer, next. Because this position is found in the bylaws of the corporation. So, in this case, that I pointed out the one with Slayer versus Maglaya, no? on the president uh, of the school removed before his term expired. Next. I'm oh, sorry, this one, uh, BP, next. EBP vice president. Next. Okay, uh, this, uh, the, the, the two last slides, I think, uh, on cases penned by Josh Marvick also, and the more recent cases, that is. The first one, so basically, uh, a corporation supposed to develop a golf course in uh, Subic and um, would issue and sell shares to the public. So because those shares are securities, they ought to be registered, as you all know, with the SEC. So permit to sell granted by, by the SEC. So the corporation sold shares of stock. Now, unfortunately, what was claimed or represented in the prospectus was not followed. Not followed. So the supposed amenities of the golf course corporation were not uh, constructed as promised. So there was, in effect, a misrepresentation of the terms and conditions of the registration statement and the prospectus uh, prepared in connection with the registration statement. So Regina Fillard and Margarita Villarreal 
informed the SEC that they have been asking the corporation for the refund of their payment, but to no avail. So that's why they complained to the SEC and asked the SEC to order the corporation to refund to uh, Regina and Margarita the value of their shares, to return basically their investment in the corporation. So the first question, does the SEC have the power to order the refund on the value of the shares? To return, basically, the payment of the shares of stock. And the Supreme Court said, no, it is for the RTC to decide. It's an intercorporate dispute, no longer recognizable by the SEC. What makes it intercorporate in nature? Because two tests are present. The first test is relationship test. It's between the corporation and its stockholder, right? And second, nature of the controversy test, misrepresentation on what was promised to them by the corporation on the amenities no? of the uh, project they invested in. Now, second, uh, second point, next slide. Uh, does the SEC have the authority to determine if the admin violations of the SRC were committed? And this is what, this is what Judge Marvin Garden said. It's true that the matter is intercorporate in nature because two tests were present and therefore it's erroneous the part of the SEC to refund the payment of the shares. But the SEC can always conduct investigation to determine if there has been violation, admin violation of the SRC and impose sanctions accordingly. Now, we will no longer elaborate uh, because SRC anyway is not part of the bar. Yeah. Next. Can you can just check if it's penned by Josh Marvin? I think it's a 2009 decision. Can you just check? Uh, sorry, next slide, please. Okay, uh, there you go. It's uh, penned by Josh Marvin. Bello versus uh, uh, Jose Santos and Victoria Bello. Kindly back up. Okay. This is the Bello Medical Group. So, uh, Bello Medical Group filed a complaint for their leader. And she filed a complaint for Decred, the Gator Relief, against, uh, against Vicky Bello and her estranged husband, Jose Santos. I mean, sorry, I forgot the name. Anyway, okay, Vicky Bello and her, the estranged husband. So, the contention of, um, of Vicky is that the estranged husband uh, holds the shares in Bello Medical Group only in trust for uh, Vicky Bello. So the real owner is uh, Vicky Bello. Now, the strange husband claimed that he owns those shares. In fact, they registered in his name. And he would like to inspect the books and records of the corporation, Bello Medical Group. So because it's not clear who is the real owner of the shares, Bello Medical Group filed an action with their pleader to compel both uh, claimants to litigate and prove who is the real owner of those shares. In the meantime, in the meantime, pending termination of whether or not the strange husband was a stockholder of the corporation. Bellamy Group refused now access of corporate records to the strange husband of Biggie Bello. Okay, so the question is, is this intra-corporate in nature? Okay, and the Supreme Court said yes. So, can you imagine, an action for interpreter, no? Could be an intercorporate uh, dispute because two tests are present. The first test, okay, corporation and stockholder. The stock and transfer book, the relative corporate indicate that the strange husband is a stockholder. Therefore, the first test is present. Second test is about right of inspection, right? So even though the, the, the prayer, the interpreter is to determine who's better right to the shares, uh, the end result is to determine if stockholders are right of inspection. So therefore, the second test is present. The, it, is, it is rooted on intercorporate relation. It pertains to enforcement of rights and obligations under the code and the rules of the corporation. So whether or not he is a stockholder, whether or not he should be denied or given right of inspection is intercorporate in nature. It refers to enforcement of rights and obligations under the corporation code. So for which reason, it is in the corporate in nature. Next.
Okay. Now, sorry. There's, there's another, another case penned by John Marvick Leonem. Recent. Uh, Malcaba. No? Versus. Can you just check the citation? Sorry. Malcaba versus ProHealth Pharma. It's very important. When you pass the bar. I, think, no, I didn't say if you pass the bar. When you pass the bar, it's it's a term, not a condition. And I'm I'm confident that you would all pass the bar examination. Your state of preparedness such that you're ready to take the bar examination. Now it's very important when you go to practice after passing the bar. You have to make sure that the court you will file the complaint with has jurisdiction. What happened in this case? This applies. This is a practical application of our discussion on intercorporate dispute. Remember, we said uh, removal of a corporate officer intercorporate in nature. It's not a labor dispute, right? Removal of a president of the corporation is intercorporate in nature because the corporate officer or the president is a corporate officer because he's holding on to a position prescribed by statute, right? So the president of the corporation was removed basically. He filed a complaint with the labor arbiter and won. And won. And because judgment of the decision, resolution of the uh, labor arbiter is immediate executory, he got his judgment reward. He got paid, basically. While the case was pending by the CA and eventually the Supreme Court. And this is what the Supreme Court is Justice Marvin Gunnett, as we pointed out a while ago. So he is the president of the corporation. He is holding on to a position prescribed by, by law. And of course, if it is uh, by law, he is considered a corporate officer, right? Therefore, that complaint should have been filed with the RTC, not the labor arbiter. Okay, we know that, right? There is a catch. Whatever amount he received, as a result of a judgment issued by the labor arbiter, should be returned to his employer without prejudice to his right to file a complaint with the RTC. So that's a price that he had to pay. The lawyer had to pay, right? A price he has to pay because it was filed in the wrong forum. Should have been filed with the RTC, not with the labor arbiter. Next. Okay. Uh, now, this is a case involving Ayala Land, the developer and seller of Ordinetta Village. Ordinetta Village uh, was constructed in 1950. Uh, it's the less low, but it's known for the second best, well, it's, anyway, it's what Google says, the second most expensive uh, place to stay here in the Philippines, but, uh, the first Forbes, second is Ordinetta, third now is Dasma, sometimes Dasma is second, Ordinetta third, anyway. So, Ayanan, the developer, instead of the lots in Ordinetta Village. So, merong, uh, after that, merong established na home owners association. Merong kayong restriction dun sa, um, sa master deed and nakanotate sa title PCTs covering lots purchased by uh, lot owners and home owners. So, JACA Investment bought three lots in Ordinetta Village. And uh, basically, Jack invest, Investment wanted to remove the restriction. Kasi only for family to, hindi ka pwedeng pwede gumawa ng building or occupy the property for business purpose. It's for residential purpose, basically. So, Jack wants to res- remove the res- those restrictions uh, because more than more than 50 years. So, the term of cooperation has expired. So, the restriction is coterminous with the original term of the cooperation. Anyway, the issue is, does RTC have jurisdiction over the case? No. It's in the corporate, right? In the corporate. Member of the association and and uh, uh, the developer. So it is in the corporate, but not cognizable by the RTC. Cognizable by the HLRUB. So jurisdiction over intercorporate dispute between condo corporation and its members or members of the condo corporation among themselves cognizable by the RTC. But if it is a dispute between the uh, association and the members or members among themselves of a subdivision, it is the HRUB that has jurisdiction. All right, let's move on to intellectual uh, property. Uh, 
uh, limited to copyright. Uh, I remember distinctly what was of uh, the first obligator. So the first question is, is Hatsdor copyrightable? And the Supreme Court said, Hatsdor is not copyrightable. Anything utilitarian as a general rule is not copyrightable. Okay. It is a useful article or product, all right, but it is not copyrightable. There is nothing aesthetic or literary or creative about Hatsdor. Okay. Now, uh, what is copyrightable in this case? Not the hot store itself, but the drawing or sketch of the hot store. So if you reproduce the drawing or the sketch without the consent of the one who prepared it, of course, you infringe on the copyright of uh, uh, the one who prepared the drawings and the sketches. But what about if, let's say, uh, it has been conclusively established, or in this case it was not, but let's assume that it was established that the second obligator Publicated and manufactured the hat store based on the design or drawing of the first obligator. Is there infringement of copyright? And Supreme Court said none. There would have been infringement if he reproduced the drawing sketch without the consent of uh, the owner. But in this case, uh, it was, if it was based only on the drawing or sketch of uh, the owner, meaning the hat store produced or manufactured out of the drawing or sketch, no infringement of copyright. Why? Because patent different from copyright. In patent, you remember, only, only for the purpose of discussion, the comparison, right? Not to discuss patent uh, as a topic, but just to compare with copyright. For uh, patent, you remember, what will be patented will be a product that satisfies the element, of course, of novelty, inventive step, industrial applicability, or a process with the same uh, elements. Now, uh, if a process has been patented, then the use of the uh, process without the consent of the patentee amounts to infringement of patent. At the same time, the, uh, the use, selling, importation of a product obtained from the patented process is by itself infringement of patent. But not so when it comes to copyright. The Supreme Court said, unlike a patent, a copyright gives 
no exclusive right to the art disclose. Protection is only given to the expression of the idea, but not to the idea itself. Okay, next. Now, related, of course, to this case, is a useful article, copyrightable. So you may say, when may a hot door be copyrightable? So it is a, um, a product of with usefulness, meaning useful article we said cannot be copyrighted, right? But is there an exception? There is an exception, the so-called Dinecola test, that is, if there's a design element on the hot door that can be conceptually and physically separated from the usefulness of the product or the article. So if the design can exist independently of usefulness of the product or the article, vice versa, then the design may be copyrightable, okay? but not the article itself. So the design, which can exist independently of the uh, article, may be copyrightable. That is the Nicola test. But if they can exist independently of the usefulness of the article or the product, then the design is not copyrightable. Okay, now, design, let's say a belt, being an object utility with a function preventing one's pants from falling down is itself not copyrightable. However, an ordinately designed belt buckle, which is relevant to or did not enhance the belt's function, hence separable conceptually from the belt, is eligible for copyright. Uh, it is copyrightable sculptural work, independent aesthetic value, and not an integral element or part of the belt's functionality. As an example, a table lamp is not copyrightable, right? Uh, it is a functional object. And uh, the lamp stamp is also not copyrightable. I mean, the table lamp, right, rather, not copyrightable because it contributes to the lamp's ability to eliminate the, tree, the reaches of the room. But what if the lamp base is in the form of a statue of male and female dancing figures so made of uh, semi vitreous china? With that case, it becomes copyrightable. So, as I said, based on this test, the hot door may become copyrightable if they bear design elements that are physically and conceptually separable, independent, and distinguishable from the hot door itself. Next. Okay, next. Okay, uh, another potential bar exam question. In fact, I am placing my bet no, uh, on this case as the likely question on copyright. Now, of course, we, we have to make uh, many options. Just, we have to discuss possible other options, right? But I'm placing my bet on this case because, number one, never been asked in the bar. Second, penned by Justice Marvick Lonen. So first of the preparatory topic, what are non-copyrightable works? Our keyword is irigta is our code for non-copyrightable work. I stands for idea, right? Uh, system, procedure, method, principle, discovery, or mere data even express or embodied in a work. That's I, idea. And news of the day. Okay, I, items of mere press information. G, works of government. So that would include likewise text of legal, admin, or legislative nature. And then, um, T is um, the I, idea, and news of the day, and the I is a mere press information, G works of government, T, okay, sorry, text of legislative, admin, or or uh, legislative nature, including translation thereof, and the last one, A, A, sermons, lectures, addresses, delivered before courts of justice, or public assemblies. So the, the A stands for assembly. Sermons, lectures, addresses, dissertations, pronounced, read before courts of justice, other agencies, and deliberative assemblies. Meetings that are considered public in nature or character. There you go. So those are the non-copyrightable works. But let's focus your attention on the first and the second idea and news of the day. So we all know idea and news of the day are not copyrightable, right? Next slide. That's why the format or mechanics of a TV show as held in Joaquin versus uh, Drilon is not copyrightable. What is copyrightable is the audio visual work based on that format or mechanics of a TV show, right? But not the format or the mechanic itself. So if we reproduce 
the uh, audiovisual work based on the format or mechanics, you infringe on the copyright of the owner. But if you just copy, you pattern your uh, TV show on the same format or mechanics, you infringe on copyright. Now, so idea, of course, news are not copyrightable, but expression of the idea, expression of the news are copyrightable. Next. And this is the case that I was referring to. I, we all know this case, right? So um, it's been discussed many times in uh, the bar review and uh, regular courses, the case of ABS-CBN versus uh, Goshen. Goshen is the chairman of uh, GMA7. So what is the background of this case? OFW, Angelo de la Cruz, was kidnapped by Iraqi militants, a condition for the release and the man was made for the withdrawal of Filipino troops. So after negotiations, uh, he was eventually released by his captors. So this uh, story generated so much public interest. So occasioned by the homecoming of Angelo uh, de la Cruz, ABS-CBN conducted a live video coverage of the arrival and then broadcasted the same um, at the NAIA, meaning broadcast arrival, that is, at the IA and subsequent press conference. Now, ABCBN had an agreement with Reuters. So, ABCBN basically allowed Reuters to air the footages under special embargo agreement. So, Reuters subscribed to ABCBN. So, Reuters was able to have access to this uh, video footage. No? But under the special embargo agreement, meaning you cannot disclose or use this story unless certain conditions are met or without the permission of the owner. In this case, ABS-CBN. Now, GMA-7 subscribes to Reuters and therefore gain access to this footage. So GMA-7 uh, carried the live news feed in its own program flash report without the consent of ABS-CBN. All right. So when ABS-CBN sued uh, the officials of GMA-7 for infringement of copyright, uh, the defenses of um, of uh, GMA 7s officials are as follows. Number one, the news is not copyrightable. And second, it had no idea or no notice was given to it. Not, not aware was was uh, not aware that Reuters was airing footages of ABS CBN. So no idea, meaning no notice, no knowledge that what it was what it carried in its live news feed was a video footage of the ABS event. The first issue was the news footage copyrightable. Next. As we said, the idea or the event might be distinguished from the expression of the idea or expression of the news. Expression of the idea, as we saw a while ago, is copyrightable. Expression of the news, likewise, copyrightable. So video footage is expression of the news. That's why it is copyrightable. So news coverage in television includes framing shots, using images and um, graphics and sound effects. It involves creative process and originality. So for which reasons, the Supreme Court said the video footage on the arrival or homecoming of Andrew Cruz is copyrightable. Therefore, it cannot be used without the consent of ABS-CBN. The use of this copyrightable work without the consent of ABS-CBN infringes on the copyright of ABS. Next. What about the defense of good faith or lack of criminal intent? So may, may the criminal prosecution of enrichment of copyrightable material uh, be negated by lack of criminal intent or the presence of good faith. For you all know, you all know the answer to this question. So violations of the Internet Property Code are malum prohibitum. Therefore, malice or criminal intent is not an element of the offense. So as long as there is infringement, uh, what is infringement again? As long as there is an act that violates the rights granted by law to the author or owner of the copyrightable material work, if you infringe on any of those economic and moral rights of the owner or holder of the copyright, regardless of good faith or lack of criminal intent, infringement is committed. Otherwise, Supreme Court said, 
to require or assume the need to prove intent defeats the very purpose of intellectual property protection. Next. Now, of course, nothing can be doctrinal than this principle on copyright. So when is copyright acquired? You all know it is acquired from the moment of creation, right? The moment of creation. So the literary artistic works that were enumerated a while ago are protected from the moment of creation. So therefore, all of those economic and moral rights of the uh, holder of the copyrightable material work exist from the moment of creation. So regardless of the registration of the copy of the work with the National Library or the IP as deputized with the National Library, so rights are acquired. And therefore, if any act is done that infringes on those more economic rights, then the holder of the copyrightable work may sue for infringement. In fact, uh, the, under PD 49, you remember, the remedy available to the owner of the copyright whose work was infringed was just to secure an injunction against the use of that copyrightable work, right? Now, under the Director Property Code, it's not limited to injunction. The owner or holder of the copyrightable work may sue for infringement and ask for actual moral and exemplary damages. Okay. Next. So what is the effect then of registration and deposit with National Library or the IP as deputized by National Library? Okay, now, the fact that the work is registered with the National Library or the IP as deputized by the uh, National Library uh, does not confer copyright. And in fact, it does not make the work copyrightable if by its nature or under the law, it's not copyrightable. So the protective matter of copyright now will not apply if the work in the first place is not copyrightable. The fact it's registered with the National Library does not make it copyrightable. Of course, we can cite a few examples. A, um, uh, so many cases, Salinas, right? Uh, I leave bushing. I leave bushing is uh, a protected uh, plastic no, to a part of uh, a car engine. And uh, the owner of that I leave bushing was able to get certificate of copyright with National Library, meaning he registered the same with National Library. And National Library issued certificate of copyright on I leave bushing. Now, I leave bushing is not an aesthetic, it is useful, but not aesthetic, right? It's more appropriate for patent, for utility model, but not copyright. So will the fact that the National Library issued certificate of copyright make that I did Bushy copyrightable? The answer is no. Okay. Or um, container of a medical cream, a uh, Cobercier, right? Remember the case, Cobercier, container of medical cream. The container, of course, is not copyrightable. The medical cream, likewise, not copyrightable. It's patentable, right? The, cup, the container that has a mark may be subject of trademark. It said what was acquired, certificate with copyright. So if, if another person or entity uses, sells that, that medical cream with the container, of course, including the, yeah, as contained in that container, is infringement of copyright committed? No, because in the first place, that work is not that product is not copyrightable. Okay. Subject of trademark or patent as the case may be, but not proper for copyright. Or trading goods, right? Trading goods that do that, uh, money versus that do that. Uh, trading goods covered by certificate of uh, copyright registration. So will that make uh, the, the valuable and the possible and other trading goods owned by the company be copyrightable on the strength of certificate issued by the IPO? It is not. So it does not make a non-copyrightable work copyrightable just because it's registered with the National Library, right? And you don't you you don't become the owner of the copyrightable work just because you had it registered with the uh, National Library. So what then is the effect of uh, administration and deposit of the copy of the National Library? It's just to serve as a notice of recording and registration of the work and a prima facie evidence of ownership. But it's not conclusive. It's the only prima facie evidence of ownership, but not conclusive. It can obviously be overcome by evidence to the contrary. Next. 
So what rights are derived from copyright uh, for economic rights and moral rights? Uh, but economic rights not part uh, of our discussion based on that revised syllabus. So it makes mention only of moral rights. Next. Next. Okay, what are the so-called moral rights of a copyright holder? Our keyword here is A, A, with. Okay, A, attribution. The right of attribution. Okay, A, the right to alter. W, the right to withhold publication of his work. And then I is the right of integrity. So the right to object to the modification, mutilation, distortion of his work that will be prejudicial to his honor. And the uh, the F stands for false attribution, right against false attribution, meaning the right to receive the use of his name for a work that's not his or distorted version of his work. Now on attribution, on attribution, so it's not enough, of course, that the name be uh, indicated, the name of the author be indicated. It has to be the prominent way on the copy or collection, the public use of the work. Remember the case of Habana versus Robles, um, a few uh, pages of a book on grammar and composition copied by another author. The number of pages does not even account for 50% of the uh, total manuscript, um, total, um, the, 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 the entire manuscript or the entire book. Only a few pages on uh, samples of grammar and composition. And the Supreme Court said, right, uh, the test of substantiality is not number of copies or pages copied, but the effect of that copy on the value of the copyright work. To the extent that the uh, work of the author was diminished sensibly, then there is infringement of copyright, right? Now, and the Supreme Court likewise said, uh, the second author did not make the attribution. So had the second author made the appropriate attribution, appropriate attribution, there would have been no infringement of copyright. So the right of attribution is a moral right of the author. Uh, alteration of his work prior to or withholding it from publication. We have an example in, late, in a short while. The right of integrity, uh, as we said, the right to object to any modification, distortion of his work if it will be prejudicial to his honor and reputation. And the last one, uh, right against for attribution. So right again to restrain the use of his name for work that's not his or distorted version of his work. Thanks. So this is my example. Uh, SJ Computer Genius Commission WI, a former managing editor of the largest publishing company in the world, to write SJ's autobiography, SJ Steve Jobs. SJ preoccupied by his overwhelming ambition to grow his company, to be able to offer technological products that will benefit mankind, did not get to spend much time with his children. His attention in having the autobiography is for his children to get the real Steve Jobs, his virtues and frailties. Now, W.I., Walter Isaacson, accepted the engagement on one condition. It will be a no host barred account of SJ's life. SJ had been. But after finishing the book, W.I., not happy with it and refused to publish it. Right. May SJ compel W.I. to publish the book. And of course, the answer is no, right? Because the right to publish is a moral right of the author. Steve Jobs or SJ can sue uh, WI for breach of contract, right? Because there's a contract to do the autobiography. He was paid for it. And because it was not published accordingly, then he can sue for damages. But he can never compel the author to publish it. The publication is a moral right of the author. Next. May the moral rights, no, no, it's not included, this, not part of. Okay, next. Term of moral right, another potential bar exam question, the way I look at it. Uh, what is the term of moral right? We all know all moral rights are coterminous with economic rights of the author, creator of the work. So generally 50 years after the death, 
of the author of the literary artistic work. So lifetime plus 50 years after his death. So moral rights, coterminous with economic rights. But there is only one right that is not coterminous with economic rights. What is that? The right of attribution. The right of attribution as an amendment to the IP code is now in perpetuity. Okay, let's give an example. Okay, the composer of a song assigned his right to the composition 50 years after the composer's death, the signing changed the tempo of Ambala Dura and claimed the owner of the musical composition. Now, for being the assignee, he can change, right? Or modify or transform the work from Ballad to Rap. But can he claim to be the owner or composer, rather, of the musical uh, composition? The answer is no, right? Because that right of attribution belongs to the composer. So by claiming that he is the composer, Infringed, infringes rather on the copyright of the composer, the original composer. Next. Okay, fair use. What is fair use? Fair use is basically a privilege to use the uh, copyrightable material work without the consent of the author and not amounting to infringement. Again, what is the essence of copyright infringement? Basically, any act that violates the moral and economic rights of the holder of the copyright. But under the doctrine of fair use, so it's the use of the copyrightable material in a reasonable manner will not amount to infringement of copyright. It's basically an exception to the copyright owner's monopoly of the use of the work to avoid stifling of uh, creativity which is what the law court is designed to accomplish or foster. So under this doctrine, uh, the fair use of copyrighted work for uh, criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, and uh, scholarship and similar purposes is not a form or does not amount to copyright infringement. So what are the factors to be considered in determining fair use? Now, whether or not uh, it amounts to fair use requires application of the four-factor test. So these are the factors to be taken into account in determining whether uh, the use of the copyrighted work is consistent with fair use or not. The first, the first purpose or character of the use, including whether such use is for commercial nature or non-profit educational purpose. So therefore, if the purpose is not for criticism, comment, news, scholarship, or teaching, or similar purposes, it is not to be taken in favor of the user. So if the user will use it for economic or uh, profit purposes, then the doctrine obviously will not apply. Second, the nature of the copyrighted work. So is it creative or factual? If it is more creative, it is likely to be taken against the user. If it is factual, it will be taken in favor of the user. Third, the amount and substantiality of the portion use relation to the uh, copyrighted work as a whole. So the production of a few pages, significant portion of the work, for example, is consistent with fair use. But if you reproduce the entire uh, work, then Obviously, the element, the third element will not be present. There's an exception, of course, as cited by the case of Justice Marvick in ABS CBN versus Gosson, like a, a, a parody. So, parody, of course, you imitate no? the style of a writer with exaggeration to produce comic effect. So, you can reproduce the entire work uh, because precisely you're trying to uh, uh, exaggerate the style of the author to produce comic effect. That's an exception. But generally, reproduction of substantial portion of the work is not consistent with fair use. And the last element is the effect of the use upon the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work. So it harm the market of the copyrighted work. If the question, if the answer is yes, that is taken against the user. If the answer is not taken in favor of the user of the work. X. Okay, those are the explanations. Now, interestingly, I pointed out uh, 
in my book, anyway, the ABS-CBN case, the one uh, we discussed a while ago penned by Justice Marvick, the respondents no, from GMA 7 invoked as one of the defenses fair use. With the footage was only aired for five seconds. But Just Marvick Dona said that uh, whether or not we consider as fair use is a matter of defense, as the case involves determination of probable cause only at the preliminary investigation stage. It, there was no trial yet. So the issue was just probable cause, whether or not it should proceed to trial. Next. Next. Okay, let's take a look at some couple of bar exam questions on uh, fair use. Bertuccio, composer of Ilocano songs, who has been quite popular in the local region. Pasquala is a professor of music in a local university with special focus on the genius music. When she heard the musical works of Bertuccio, she purchased a CD of his work. She copied the CD and sent the second copy to her music class with instructions for the class to listen to the CD and analyze the works of Bertuccio. Did Pasquala, the professor, infringe on Bertuccio, the composer, copyright? So the answer is no, because uh, the use of a work for uh, teaching, education purposes, including uh, multiplication of a uh, few copies, would not amount to infringement, but consistent with fair use. Another question um, about uh, a... Uh, well, photocopying of uh, a book and the defense of uh, the owner of the establishment that photocopies the book in its entirety is that they are used for educational purposes by those who want to avail themselves of these copies. So is invocation of document fair use proper in this case? Again, obviously it's not proper because it is for profit. It's not for educational purpose. It is not for the educational purpose of the owner of the establishment, right? It is he's doing it for profit. And and then what other elements are not present to bury the obligation of document fair use? Uh, the amount and substantiality of the portion of the work used in relation to the copyrighted work. And the fourth one, the effect of the use of the potential market of the copyrighted work. Okay, let's move on to insurance. Now, for uh, insurance, uh, topics for inclusion, what can be insured and claims in a life insurance. So, what can be insured for life, for health, uh, property, loss, or damage in marine insurance, casualty liability to third party non performance by principal debtor of his obligation to the obligee or the creditor. Next. Next. Now, um, for insurance, other than the case of uh, Alvarez versus uh, Insular Life and Union Bank, uh, there are no other, well, cases uh, penned by Justice Marvick, and there are no canonical, uh, meaning there are no end bank decisions of the Supreme Court on insurance. Uh, there would have been one, the case of Henson versus CB General Insurance on a period of subrogation, but subrogation is not part of the bar, right? It's, it's not... Uh, included in the reduced syllabus. So my gut feel tells me that if there be a question on insurance law based on these two topics, other than the case of Alvarez, it, the question is likely to be based on the commonly asked questions on insurance. Because these are basic doctrines, and even though they're not end bank decisions, they are basic doctrines that basically amount to canonical principles to the same. So the first one is this. If a person procures insurance on his own life, we all know that he can name anyone as his beneficiary, right? As long as the name beneficiary is not disqualified to receive donation under 79 of the civil law. Okay. So a person procures in insurance on his own life, he can name anyone as beneficiary, provided that name beneficiary is not disqualified to receive donation under 79 of the civil code. Now, we all know, of course, who are those qualified to receive donation under 79 of civil code. Next slide, sir. So, persons, illicit relations, like adultery or concubinage, here, no need for conviction. It's a public knowledge that they're living in adultery or concubinage. 
second person found guilty of without clear concubinage and public officer, wife, descendants, or ascendants. Now, the, the case of Maramag versus Maramag, uh, it, it, is, it is basically a, a basic uh, doctrine and I, and I think um, even though it's not an end bank decision, it is in effect a canonical uh, principle. That, that is what happens if uh, the insured took insurance on his own life and named his common law spouse and common law or legitimate children as beneficiaries. Can the lawful spouse complain? Can the lawful spouse file a complaint, say, to uh, nullify the designation of the beneficiary? Or claim that the share of the illegitimate children be only one half of the share of the lawful children? And the rest should go to the estate of the uh, insured. Well, the Supreme Court said, said in the case of Maramag versus Maramag, so while it is not allowed to name your common law spouse as beneficiary. There is no prohibition or prescription in naming your common law or legitimate children as beneficiary. So therefore, the share of the unlawfully named beneficiary shall be forfeited not in favor of the estate, but in favor of the lawfully named beneficiary. So everything should go to the common law or legitimate children. Now, why is it that the spouse and the legitimate children of the insured cannot complain? Right? Why, why can they not argue based on the privation of legitimate? Because this is insurance, right? And under the insurance uh, code, so to whom will the proceeds of the life insurance be given or delivered? To the one named in the beneficiary. So to the beneficiary the name in the policy for whose interest and benefit the policy was procured. X. Okay, next. Now, uh, another favorite question in the bar, revocable designation of the beneficiary. So what are the effects of the revocable designation of beneficiary. So as you know, if the beneficiary is revocably designated, then the insured may add, subtract, or change the beneficiary, right? Even without the consent of the beneficiary. Now, what if the um, what if it is silent on whether or not designation is revocable or irrevocable? Then the presumption is it is revocable. Now, of course, what would be the consequence if it is one of irrevocable designation? Then the beneficiary cannot be changed, added to, some, uh, without the consent of the beneficiary. So any act that would impair the interest of the irrevocably named beneficiary will not be allowed. Next. Don't forget this part. Uh, it's a combination of bar is barring some questions and settled uh, principles on insurance law. Uh, to whom will the proceeds of life insurance be payable? So, number one, if the beneficiary is unlawfully named or designated, the proceeds should be payable to the estate of the insured. So, if a common law spouse is named as beneficiary, the proceeds are payable to the estate of the insured. Now, they are not payable only to the surviving spouse of, uh, of the insured. They can be other heirs, right? So payable to the estate of the insured. Now, it's because the policy is valid on all designation is void. Now, what about in case of joint designation of beneficiaries? So two or more uh, beneficiaries. The rule is the share of the lawfully named beneficiary shall pass on to the lawfully named beneficiary. That's the case of Maramag versus Maramag. Uh, what about in case of joint designation of lawfully named or designated beneficiaries. The proceeds will be divided based on the terms of the policy, of course. If the policy is silent, proceeds shall be divided equally between or among the beneficiaries. Next. Now, 
in case the beneficiary is lawfully name resignated and the insured dies ahead of the beneficiary as is expected, right? Supposed to be the case. The insured uh, usually dies first, no? Than the beneficiary. So the insured dies ahead of the beneficiary. The proceeds are payable, of course, to the beneficiary, name the policy, unless that beneficiary is the principal accessory accomplice will fully bring about the death of the insured. What happens in that case? If the beneficiary is a principal accessory accomplice, it will fully bring about the death of the insured. Does it invalidate the policy? And the answer is no. The, the, the insurer is still liable. The policy uh, may still be enforced, but based on this rule, the interest of the beneficiary should be forfeited and the share forfeited shall pass on to the other beneficiaries unless otherwise disqualified. Now, if there are no other beneficiaries, the proceeds shall be divided or paid uh, based on for the policy contract if the policy is silent, that's the only time the proceeds are payable to the estate of the insured. Now, what if the beneficiary predeceases? No, 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 So, insured. What happens now? Make a distinction between a revocable and irrevocable uh, designation of beneficiary. If the designation is, um, is revocable, proceeds are inured to the estate of the insured. If it is irrevocable, payable to legal representatives of the beneficiary. Thanks. All right. Uh, the most one of the most favorite questions in the bar uh, on what can be insured, right? Distinguish life insurance from property insurance. Okay, in terms of insurable interest, for example, next. Okay, first, uh, in property insurance, what is the value of the interest of the owner of the property? So the what is the relevance of the value, the reasonable interest on the property? So the value of the property, of course, the limit of the insurance that can be placed there on. It's a contract of indemnity, so you can only recover based on actual loss. You cannot indicate in the policy an amount higher than the value of the property. So what about life insurance? Well, you can put a price tag, right, on the value of a human life. You can indicate any amount that you want. So the liability of the insurer based on the uh, terms of the policy, the face value of the policy. So that's the limit. It's only because that is what the insured wants. But theoretically, he can put a price on any on any. He can he can indicate any price as he pleases, as long as he's willing to pay for the proper amount of premium. Now there is only one exception, as you all know. That is, if the creditor or the mortgagee takes insurance on the life of the debtor or the mortgagor. In which case, it is limited to the amount of the debt. Second distinction, in property insurance, the insurable interest must exist when the insurance is, the policy is issued or becomes effective at the time of the loss. For life insurance, it is necessary or it is only required that the insurable interest exists at the time of the issuance of the policy and not at the time of the loss. All right. And the third one, the beneficiary in property insurance must have insurable interest, right, over the property and that Insurable interest must be covered by the policy. Right. So the owner of a property may have insurable interest on his, of course, on his property if he obtains a loan and secured that loan with a mortgage on his property. The mortgage likewise has insurable interest over the property, right? So if the mortgage procures fire insurance on the property and the property is destroyed by fire, can the owner of mortgage or uh file a claim with the with the uh, insurance company, the answer is no. Because while he may have insurable interest on the property as a result of ownership, that insurable interest must be protected, specified, indicated, and covered by the policy. What about life insurance? In life insurance, as we said, no, a person can take insurance on his own life and name anyone as his beneficiary. As long as not disqualified to receive donation under 79 of the civil code, now, that beneficiary need not have insurable interest on the life of the insured. 
it is when the insured takes insurance on the life of another that he must have insurable interest in the life of the person he is insuring. Next. Okay, with those distinctions, let's take a look at uh, commonly asked by some questions. Okay, number one. In a civil suit, the court ordered Benji to pay not 5 million pesos. The executive judgment the sheriff levied upon Benji's registered property, a land in a building thereon, and sold the same at public auction to not the highest bidder. The latter, on April 18, 2019, registered the RB certificate of sale issued to him by the sheriff. Meanwhile, on January 27, 2020, Benji insured with Garapal Insurance for 5 million, the same building sold at auction to NAT. So Benji uh, failed to redeem the property by April 19, 2020. On May 2, 2020, a fire raised the building to the ground. Garapal Insurance refused to make goods obligation to Benji under the insurance contract. Okay, let's take a look at the facts. So Benji is the uh, judgment debtor, not is the judgment creditor. Okay. So the sheriff levied on uh, Benji, the uh, judgment debtor, levied on his property. And so the same at public auction to not, who is the judgment creditor. Okay. Now, so the uh, the judgment creditor uh, had the say registered with the um, RD. That is April 18, 2019. What's the relevance of that date, April 18, 2019? Uh, you start counting the one-year period to redeem the property, right? So given this a sale of your property on execution, the judgment debtor has one year to redeem the property. Reckon from the date of registration of the sale, right? And then um, it's only when the property was levied on execution that the owner, the judgment debtor, right, procured or obtained insurance on the property. Okay. So take note, no insurance is procured by judgment creditor, only by judgment debtor, but only after the levy on the property, right? And then on May 2, 2020, a fire raised the building, meaning one year after registration of the sale, that property was destroyed by fire. So can the mortgagor or can the judgment debtor rather recover on the fire insurance policy. And what about the judgment creditor? Can he recover based on the insurance policy procured by the judgment debtor? Okay, next. Now, of course, we all know. So the judgment debtor cannot recover the insurance policy because when it was destroyed by fire, he was no longer the owner of the same because the period to redeem the property had expired. So if the loss occurs after expiration of the redemption period, the owner, whether mortgage or judgment debtor, has no more insurable interest in the property. We said a while ago that insurable interest might exist when the policy was issued and at the time of the loss, right, for property insurance. Now, what about the judgment uh, creditor? Can he recover on the fire insurance policy procured by judgment debtor? The answer is no, because there was no sign in the policy in his favor. And he did not procure his own insurance policy, or his, not, his own insurance rather, on the same property. He could have, because he levied on the property, right? He has inchoate uh, right to that property. If the, the redemption is not exercised, then he becomes the owner. But he failed to procure the insurance policy, and he cannot recover on the policy Obtain the judgment debtor because it was not assigned to him. Next. Okay, another favorite question in the bar, I think uh, four or five times asked about an employer who procured life insurance or insurance on the life of its president, at the same time procured property or fire insurance on the house that the employer owns but occupied temporarily by the president. All right, so you have two insurance policies, life insurance on the president and uh, property insurance on the house owned by the employer but occupied by the president. And then uh, on the relevant dates here, September 1, 2019, the president resigned from uh, the company and bought 
the company house he had to occupy. Two days later, he purchased the house. A fire occurred, resulting in the death of uh, the president, former president, and destruction of the house. The question is, may the employer of the president recover on life and property insurance? Okay, yeah, of course, we all do the answer here, right? But just to be clear, to reinforce our knowledge, so the uh, employer can recover on the life insurance, right? Even though at the time of the death of the president, or former president, he was all connected with the company. Because for life insurance, it is enough that the issue interest must exist at the time of the issuance of the policy and not at the time of the loss. What about property insurance? The employer could not recover, obviously, because while it may have issuable interest, on the property at the time of the issuance of the policy, it had no more issuable interest at the time of the loss. And the property was purchased by the president. Next. Right, another favorite question. Uh, a owns a house valued at 5 million, which he has insured against fire for 7.5. Okay. So value 5 million, insured for 7.5. He obtained a loan from B. I think this was asked four or five times also, if not more. Uh, he obtained a loan from B in the amount of 3.5 million and to secure payment thereof, he signed a little mortgage in the house, but without assigning the insurance policy to the latter, meaning to the mortgage. For A's failure to pay the loan upon maturity, B foreclosed the mortgage and uh, the mortgage was the winning bidder, B in this case. Upon issuance of the COS, certificate of sale, in his favor, B, the mortgage, he insured the house against fire 40.5, the amount of the debt with the other insurance company. Now, to redeem the house, so A, the mortgagor, assigned the insurance policy to C for 7.5 million pesos. Before he could pay his obligation to C, the house was destroyed by fire and totally burned. So there are three persons involved here, right? The mortgagor, the mortgagee and the assignee of the policy of the mortgagee. Do they have insurable interest on the property? Okay, of course, we all know the answer here, but let's enforce our knowledge, given that it's a favorite question in the bar. So the mortgagee, the owner, of course, he has insurable interest in the house, not for 7.5, right? But for 5 million only, the actual value of the house. But when he assigned the policy to C, he lost insurable interest. We all know property insurance, it should exist in time, issue on the policy in time of the loss. What about the mortgage G? The mortgage can recover or is separate uh, for insurance, 40.5 million, right? The amount of the mortgage debt. And then what about C? Well, he has to issue interest on A's house when the insurance took effect. He was not the owner, right? When uh, the policy was issued. His interest is mere contingent or expected interest not founded on actual right a valid contract to a house. So therefore, C cannot recover. Next. Okay, next. Okay, what about in marine insurance? What pair may be insured against? Another favorite question in the bar. So you all know only perilous of the sea may be insured against, right? To recover under a marine insurance policy, the approximate cost of the loss must be perils of the sea. Insurer not liable if the loss of damage occasioned by perils of the ship. Now, perils of the ship, of course, you know, losses or damage arising from due or due to ordinary uh, natural limitable action of the sea, only ordinary natural limitable action of the sea or ordinary wear and tear and uh, unseaworthiness, right? So, uh, loss due to seaworthiness is tantamount to perils of the ship. Okay, the only exception is an all-risk marine insurance policy that uh, makes the insurer liable for loss or damage regardless of the cost, whether or not due to perils of the sea or perils of the ship, or subject, of course, to accepted risk, and if it is the loss or damage due to the fraudulent conduct or act of the insured. Next. 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 Okay, this one, another favorite question in the bar. Let's examine this very carefully. Suppose that Fortune owns a house valued at 600000 and is sure the same against fire with three insurance companies follows. 
X, 400,000. Y, 200,000. And Z, 600,000. So, valued 600,000, but obtained three insurance uh, policies from different insurers. Okay. Now, we all know that this double insurance, double insurance is not uh, void, right? As long as there is no prohibition against second insurance. In the absence of any stipulation, the policy from which insurance company or companies may fortune recover in case fire should destroy the house completely. As you know, so he can elect to claim from any of the following, but not exceed the face value of the policy. So he can recover from Y, uh, from X rather, 400,000, then Y, 200,000, or he can recover entirely from uh, Z for 600,000 pesos. Now, if each of the foreign insurance policy obtained by Fortune in problem A is valued policy, and the value of the house was fixed in each of the policy at 1 million, so not only 600,000, but uh, 1 million, how much will Fortune rec recover from X if he has already obtained full payment on the insurance policy issued by X and Y? So X and Y, tiny uh, backtrack. Uh, X and Y, X and Y, that's for... Uh, 600,000 already, right? X. So he can recover the balance only from X insurance because he can recover to the extent only of his actual loss. Now, assuming the real value is 600,000, not 1 million, have you obtained full payment and insurance policy issued by YNC, he cannot recover anymore from um, our X insurance company. Now, it is, if each of the policies obtained by Fortune Problem A is an open policy and immediately determined after the fire that the value of Fortune's house was 2.4 million. So, no longer 600,000, but let's say 2.4. How much may he collect from X, Y, and C? So, the total ability of X, Y, and C only 1.2, right? 400, 200, 600,000. But the value of the house, let's say 2.4 million. So how much can be recovered? Of course, only up to the extent of the face value of the respective policy issued by X, Y, and Z. X. In problem A, going back to 600,000, what's the extent of the ability of the insurance company among themselves? So we said a while ago, they should can, uh, can has the, the right to select, right? Uh, he can claim from any of those insurance uh, companies, but not exceed the face value of the policy until he has fully recovered his uh, loss or fully indemnified of his loss. Now, what about among the insurers? What would be their uh, extent of liability among themselves? So as you know, they're liable proportionately to the, insu to the, to the insured. So if, let's say, uh, C paid the entire 600000 he has the right to obtain reimbursement proportionately from the other insurers. All right, so a total amount of Total amounts of the, the policies, uh, 1.2 million, right? And the value in problem A is only 600,000. So therefore, X with the face value of 400,000 over 12, he will cover 200,000. Y, uh, face value of 200,000 over 12, 12 because 400, 200, right? Uh, to other 12 of 100,000 is 100,000. And Z, 600 out of 12, that's 300,000, right? Now, suppose in problem A, again, 600,000, Fortune is able to collect from both Y and Z. May he keep the entire amount he was able to collect from the said two companies. May he got 800 combined. He must return 200,000 because this will uh, be contrary to the principle that uh, contract insurance one of them. Okay, next. Next. Now, casualty insurance. Uh, example, of course, is uh, motor vehicle insurance. Next. Uh, this is favorite question in the bar on casualty insurance, particularly on uh, comprehensive or motor vehicle insurance. So let's say the, the driver or, or the, the vehicle insured uh, cause injury to a pedestrian as a result of the negligent operation of the vehicle by the driver. 
Now, we all know that uh, before you can operate the public highway, you have to procure a uh, motor vehicle insurance on on uh, an insurance on the vehicle to cover for um, indemnity to third persons in case of loss or case of death rather injury as a result of the uh, operation of the vehicle. So when does the right of the insured mean that the third party, when does his right to recover under policy approve? So as I said, it's a favorite, one of those favorite topics again, the bar exam on insurance, persistent with the outline or syllabus of Justice Marvick, what can be insured. So you all know that the, uh, the, the insured is a third party, his cause of action accrues immediately upon the occurrence of injury or event upon which the liability depends. So at the moment he is injured, or death or injury caused to the third party, then his cause of action accrued. Now, it is not dependent, right, on any judgment that may be rendered against the, uh, the insured. Uh, so the, uh, the beneficiary, rather, of the policy, the third party passenger or pedestrian may file a claim with the insurance company without having to wait for any judgment that can be rendered against the insured, the owner of the vehicle. So that's true, right? So uh, no need for judgment to be rendered against the uh, owner of the vehicle who is the insured. The uh, third party may file a claim with the insurer. Right? Now, of course, while the cause of action accrued upon the occurrence of, the, um, of injury or event upon which liability uh, depends, you may have read, I'm sure you have read rather, not may, you have read in many cases that the uh, the insurer will wait uh, for a judgment, right, by the court. So if the court rules that there is no fault or negligence on the part of the insured, then the insurer will not pay, right, uh, the, uh, the third party, beneficiary. Right? He may have a cause of action. He can file a claim with the insurer, but the insurer in many cases would opt to wait. In a few cases, they would pay right away, but in some cases, they would opt to wait until judgment is rendered against the insured. What's the exception? The exception is no fault indemnity insurance. You widow without fault or negligence on the part of the insured, the insurer must pay the third party beneficiary for subject to the conditions for no fault indemnity clause, not, amount, not exceed 15,000 pesos. Next. Now, a okay. Claims against life, the second item on insurance. Okay, there are only two, right? So uh, what can be insured and claims against life? Insurance. So what are the common defenses uh, available to insurer for claims against life insurance or that are consistent with the syllabus of Josh Marvick? Concealment, misrepresentation, and incontestability clause has not set in, and also done pay with the premium. And except that for non the premium, we all know that uh, grace period is allowed for life insurance. Okay, next. So concealment, the neglect to communicate that the party knows it ought to communicate. And concealment was intentional or intentional entitles injured party to receive a contract of insurance. Okay, these are all basic uh, and in fact code of provisions, but we need to uh, refresh our memory when we discuss the case of Alvarez versus uh, Insular and Union Bank. Next. Next. Test of materiality. Uh, you all know that materiality is not determined by the event, but solely by the probable and reasonable influence of the facts upon the party to whom communication is due, informing his estimate of the disadvantages of the post contract in making inquiries. Or simply put, in other words, um, will this have any probable reasonable influence on the insurer in extending your granting insurance coverage or making more inquiries on what amount of premium to charge? If this information was disclosed to the insurer, could he have printed, printed, opted to deny or provide insurance coverage if he decides to provide insurance coverage for how much amount of premium? So that's a test of materiality. Next. Now, uh, 
if all of those questions recited are favorite topics, right? But nothing can be more favorite than this than this uh, uh, topic. Should the facts concealed be the proximate cause of the loss in order to constitute its concealment? We all know that the facts concealed need not be the cause of the loss, right? Why? Because the test of materiality is not where the facts concealed were the proximate cause of the loss. The test is, as we pointed out, the reasonable proper influence on the insurer or make his estimates of the risk, forming advantages and disadvantages of the contract and charging the amount of premium. Okay, next. So let's take a look at the cases I cited in my book. Side cases, instances, constituting concealment, even though the facts concealed were not the proximate cause of the loss. A applied for a non-medical life insurance. The insurer did not inform the insurer at one week prior to the application for insurance. He was examined, confined at St. Luke's, was diagnosed for lung cancer. They insured soon thereafter died the plane crash. No connection, right? Plane crash and non-disclosure of uh, the fact that they were examined and confined in a hospital for lung cancer. But the fast concealed need not be the cause of the loss. If this was disclosed to the insurer, perhaps it would have changed mind in granting insurance coverage or charged a higher amount of premium. They sure did not disclose that his daughter was a Mongolian child, even though the cause of the death was influenza. While the insured answered that he consulted the doctor for cough and flu complication, but the insured discovered that two weeks prior to his application, he was examined and confined at Lung, lung Center, where he was diagnosed for renal, renal failure and died in a plane crash. Again, no connection, but Supreme Court said there was possible. Okay. Anyway, next, next slide, sir. Next slide. I think we have given enough examples. Okay, next. Okay, now what about representation in the context of insurance law? What do you mean by representation? Uh, representation, statement of fact or condition relating the risk that induced the insurer to enter the contract of insurance. Representation, the statement made in compliance with duty to disclose. Now, where is representation deemed false? Because misrepresentation or false representation entitles the insurer to receive the policy, of course. Representation is deemed false when the facts fail to correspond with the assertions or stipulations. Next. Effect of false representation or misrepresentation is said to nullify or rescind the policy. Okay, next. Now, having given or having refreshed our memory on Basis of concealment and representation. Let's take a look at this case. My favorite for insurance. This is the only case penned by Justice Martin. Alvarez. I mean, of course, that is part of the syllabus. Reduced syllabus. Uh, basically, Alvarez applied for and was granted a housing loan by Union Bank. And um, Alvarez also qualified be part of the mortgage redemption insurance uh, taken on various on the lives of various mortgagors. So under terms of an MRI, mortgage redemption insurance, so insurance will be obtained, of course, on the life of the mortgagor. The proceeds are payable to the mortgagee. If the mortgagor dies, then the proceeds are applied against the loan and the mortgage should be canceled or discharged, right? Now, in this case, so Alvarez uh, died. When Union Bank, the mortgagee, filed a claim with the insurance company, Insure Life, Insure Life denied the claim of uh, Union Bank because according to uh, Insular, Alvarez concealed his actual age. If you're over 60 at the time of the loan application, you're not qualified under the terms of the mortgage redemption insurance. He concealed the fact that he was 60. Okay, that was the defense of, um, of Insular. And because Insular denied the claim of Union Bank, Union Bank now foreclosed the mortgage on the property of Alvarez. All right. So the heirs now filed an action okay, to uh, compel Insular to pay and remit the proceeds of the MRI to Union Bank and nullify the foreclosure of the mortgage. Next. So potential 
borrow some questions. Was there, number one, was there concealment? Was there concealment? And take note, there was no concealment, right? Because concealment is the neglect to communicate a material fact known to the insured. So there was no concealment here. There was instead misrepresentation. So when when his true age, when the age indicated in the document does not correspond to his true age, that's not concealment. That is misrepresentation, right? Okay. Next. Next potential question. So can the insurer rescind the policy on the ground of misrepresentation if there was no fraudulent intent on the part of the insurer? And this is the reason why I brought it up, right? In concealment, whether intentional or unintentional, if there is neglect to communicate a material fact, the insurer is entitled to rescind the policy. What about if the ground to rescind is representation or misrepresentation or false representation? The Supreme Court said there ought to be fraudulent intent. So fraud not needed for purpose of misrepresentation. So, uh, well, I don't think this should be asked in the bar because this requires uh, appreciation of evidence. Uh, in this case, the Supreme Court, I mean, this portion, I don't think it will be asked. No? The Supreme Court said in this case, uh, likely to be asked for and misrepresentation and distinction between the two. But the Supreme Court said there is no misrepresentation despite the fact that there was an erroneous indication of his age in a document. Why? Because for there to be fraudulent intent, it has to be consistent in all of the documents that he executed or signed. So if you have abundance of documents uh, signed by, signed and accomplished by, uh, by the insured, that would have indicated whether or not he really uh, misrepresented his age. Of all the abundant documents available, the insurer produced only one, the health application form. It could have produced the application for life insurance, the mortgage uh, and loan agreement with the uh, with Union Bank, but those documents were not presented, even though they're available. So the Supreme concluded there was no fraud intent on the part of the insured to hide or conceal his two age or misrepresent his two age. And therefore, the policy, the MRI should have been enforced, the proceeds should have been payable to a uh, Union Bank, a Union Bank should not have foreclosed the mortgage. So the Supreme Court therefore ordered that the proceeds be paid to the Union Bank and then cancel the foreclosure of the mortgage. So to repeat the likely potential bar exam question, the way I look at it, number one, was there concealment? No, it's not. It is misrepresentation. And the second potential bar exam question is, is fraud required for concealment and misrepresentation? So fraud is not required to be established in concealment because it is a neglect to communicate material fact known to the insured that amounts to concealment, whether intentional or unintentional. In fact, Judge Marbury Gordon said uh, fraud is inferred from concealment. Now, fraud is needed if it is if the ground for decision is misrepresentation or false representation. Next. Okay, all right. These are also favorite questions the bar, incontestability clause, and uh, suicide committed by the insured. Now, what is incontestability clause? And what are the elements? Of course, there's insurance payable on the life, uh, payable upon the death of the insured, and the policy, two years had lapsed, issuance of the policy or last reinstatement. So two years had lapsed from issuance of the policy or last reinstatement, the insurer must make good on the policy despite any concealment or misrepresentation committed by the insured during his lifetime, right? No matter how patent, how obvious the concealment or misrepresentation may have been, once two years lapse for issuance of the policy or the last statement, the insurer must make good the policy and pay the uh, beneficiaries of the insured. And what about uh, in case of suicide? So. If the policy has 
been issued for more than two years, right? Then, then the insurer is um, liable. If uh, the insured committed suicide less than two years before issuance, from issuance of the policy, insurer, of course, is not liable unless it is due to insanity, which is compensable regardless of the date of the commission of the suicide. Okay, we all know those principles, right? Let's apply. In January uh, 2016, Mitchell H was issued life insurance policy by XYC Insurance, where his wife, Ms. W, was designated as sole beneficiary. Unbeknown to XYC, however, Mr. H had been previously diagnosed with colon cancer, the fact of which Mr. H had concealed during the entire time his policy was being processed. In January 2019, that's three years, right, from 2016, Mr. H unfortunately committed suicide. Due to her husband's death, w, Ms. W, as beneficiary, filed a claim with XYC to recover the proceeds of the late Mr. H's life insurance policy. However, XYC resisted the claim, contending that the policy is void abolition because Mr. H concealed or misrepresented his medical condition, that is colon cancer. And second, as an insurer in a life insurance policy, it cannot be held liable in case of suicide. So of these two contentions, which one is correct? Right. Next. Now, the first contention, the incontestability clause invocation, of course, not tenable. Why? Because more than two years had lapsed with issuance of the policy. In fact, three years had lapsed. And because more than two years had lapsed from issuance of the policy, then the issuer cannot rescind the policy despite any concealment or misrepresentation by the issuer. Now, what about the second contention? XYC, the issuer is liable despite the suicide, right, of Mr. H. Because under the insurance code, insurer is liable when suicide is committed after the policy has been enforced for two years from date of issuance or last statement. In this case, the insurer commit suicide three years after issuance of the policy. Therefore, the uh, insurer must pay the beneficiary of the insurer. Next. Now, regarding contestability clause, um, well, just in case, just in case, just in case it will be asked, uh, you all, of course, we discuss what in contestability clause is. Um, so, two years for issuance of the policy or last statement, the issue must be good, the policy despite concealment or misrepresentation. The rationale of this clause is twofold or two pronged, right? Uh, it protects both the insurer and the insured. The insurer is protected because he has two years to investigate whether or not there was concealment or misrepresentation the part of the insured. And uh, it also benefits the insured because it will protect him from any delay in the process of his claim. At a certain point, the insurer can no longer conduct any investigation if there's concealment or misrepresentation. So given the rationale, of uh, the incontestability clause. What happens if the issuer dies within two years, right? Within two years, is the insurer liable to pay? So meaning, how would you answer if this should be asked? I hope not, because it's not, it's not canonical. In fact, it, uh, um, it is, it is um, what do you call it? The rulings in Sibia versus, uh, Sun Life and Manila Bankers versus Aban are the opposite of what you call doctrinal. What is doctrinal is Stan versus CA. What does Stan versus CA tell, uh, tell us? Even though the insured died, okay, even though the insured died, the insurer may still rescind the policy on account of concealment or misrepresentation as long as two years had not yet lapsed for issuance of the policy or last statement. Now, what Manila Bankers versus Aban and Sun Life versus Sibia tell us, however, is there are two incontestability clauses. One, if the insured dies after two years from issuance of the policy or last year's statement, or the insured dies within two years. Okay. What happened? What, what do we do in cases we be asked in the bar? No? So what do we apply? Tan versus CA, which is doctrinal, or Sun Life uh, versus Sibia, or uh, and Manila Bankers versus Aban. So if this should be asked in the bar, you go for what is doctrinal, TAN versus CA. 
So it doesn't matter if the insured dies within two years. The insurer may still rescind the policy on account of concealment or precipitation. So the, the incontestability clause has not set in if two years have not lapsed from issuance of the policy or last statement. So it does not set in just because the insured dies within two years. That is doctrinal. That's standard year. Now, what you have to add, you're not unaware that the Supreme Court said in um, Manila Bankers vs. Aban and Sun Life vs. Sibia, that the insured dies within two years, the insurer must make good the policy. Then you have to add, those are obiter dicta, what is doctrinal is Stan versus CA. Next. Okay, let's let's take up the last law included in the reduced syllabus for commercial law. Now, can you imagine of all the laws part of mercantile or commercial law, Justice Marvick chose data privacy. No transportation, right? no banking, no SPCL, no securities law, no foreign investment act, but instead data privacy. Anyway, let's take up data privacy act. Next. So who is a data subject? Data subjects, of course, are you and uh, me. Uh, data subject refers to the individual whose personal information is processed. The other subject is the party sought to be protected by Data Privacy Act. What about the parties required to comply with Data Privacy Act when it comes to data processing? So who are the persons covered by this Data Privacy Law? The Personal Information Controller or a PIC basically refers or refer to persons who control the collection and processing of personal information, including a person or organization who instructs another person to process personal information. Examples for schools, offices, the governmental or private, law firms, hospitals, HMOs, search engine operators like, uh, not any, search engine operators like uh, Google, um, social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter. And the, uh, the second one, next, personal information processor, okay, refer to uh, any natural or juridical person to whom the PIC may outsource the processing of personal information pertaining to a data subject, like business processing centers and testing centers. Next. Now, what is processing is very important, right? What is processing? Because the gist of the data privacy law is that no personal information or personal data about the data subject shall be processed without the consent of the data subject, except in the cases provided or allowed by law. That's why it's very important for us to know what processing is. The gist is you cannot process personal data, meaning personal information, or personal sensitive information without the consent of the data subject, you know what I mean? Okay, except in the case provided by law. So what therefore is data processing? Okay, processing refers to any operation or set of operations performed upon personal information, including, but not limited to, collection, recording, organization, storage, updating, or modification, retrieval, consultation, use, consolidation, Blocking, erasure, or destruction of data. Our keyword here is cross Mr. Cucumet. Cross, that is for the, the first four, collection, recording, organization, storage, right? Collection, recording, organization, storage. M, modification, R, retrieval, C, consolidation, U, use, com, uh, Com, com, uh, con consolidation, this one is uh, consolidation, and the other is consolidation. This one is collection, collection, consolidation, and consolidation. U is, um, well, the first U is updating, the other U stands for use, of course, and B, block, E, erase, D, destroy. 
So any of these acts amounts to data browsing. Now, why, why am I stressing uh, the scope definition of data browsing? Because even though consent, if given by data subject, allows for processing of uh, personal information, the consent has to be specific, informed, and in writing. So there is no such thing as a bundled consent. So can the date, can the PIC, for example, uh, get the consent of, uh, of the data subject by simply writing in its data privacy notice, you hereby consent to the processing of your information, the personal information? No, it doesn't be specific. What kind of processing? Is it cross, is it CROS, MR, QQBED, any of those? You have to specify the acts of processing to which the consent was given by the data subject. So it has to be specific, inform any writing, no such thing as bundled consent. Next. Scope or obligation of the DPA. So this is type of extraterritorial application. So it applies to all processing of uh, types of personal information. Now, so what, what is the key consideration? As long as the data subject resides, located, based, reside, or reside, live based in the Philippines. Even though the PIC and the PIP are located or situated abroad. Okay. If, let's say, they use equipment facilities abroad or PIC located abroad, as long as there's a link with data subject who's in the Philippines, then the DPA applies. Next. Now, what is sensitive personal information? First, what is personal information? So personal information is any information for which you can assert the identity of the data subject. So when, when you say personal information, of course, it includes any information from which you can assert the identity of the data subject. Now, what about sensitive personal information? So refer to the following information. Uh, first, you have the first keyword, REM CARP. REM CARP, R stands for race. Ethnic origin, marital status, C for scholar, age, religious, uh, philosophical, and political affiliations. And then HEG, next one is HEG OS, SOS. H stands for health, education, genetic, sexual life of a person, or any proceeding, or for any offense committed, that's O, or less have been committed. And S stands for the sentence of any court in such proceedings. And then the third one issued by, by government agencies peculiar, peculiar to individual. That includes but not limited to SSS numbers, previous or current health records, licenses, or its denial, suspension, or revocation, and tax return. Uh, and then those established by executive order act of Congress to be kept, of course, classified. Next. So what are the general data privacy principles that govern processing of personal information? Or that includes likewise PSI, personal sensitive information. So let's say consent was given by the data subject. On the strength of that consent, can you now process the information of the data subject? Well, the processing, despite the consent given by the data subject, must adhere to certain principles of data processing. What are those principles? First, transparency. So the, the data subject must be aware of the nature, purpose, extent, scope of the process, including risks and safeguards involved. The identity of the PIC, his or her rights as data subject. Okay. Second, legitimate purpose. Okay, legitimate purpose. The processing must be compatible with declared and specific purpose that is not contrary to law, morals, or public policy. And the third one, proportionality. Okay, so transparency, legitimate purpose, and uh, proportionality, meaning the processing of information shall be adequate, relevant, suitable, necessary, and not excessive in relation to the declared and specified purpose of the um, PIC. So just enough, basically, to accomplish the purpose of the uh, PIC. Thanks.
Okay, criteria for log processing of personal information, uh, meaning in what are the cases that you can process personal information? Actually, it's so simple, even though it's quite, you know, uh, long, the enumeration may, may be quite long, but easy to remember, consent, what are the sources of obligation? Consent, all right, in compliance with a contract that this subject has with the PIC, third, in fulfillment of a legal obligation, and then uh, fourth, uh, when vital interest is necessary, like life or health, national emergency, and pursuing legitimate interest of uh, the PIC. So consent, contract, legal obligation, or compliance with law. Next. And then processing is necessary to protect vital important interest like, like life and health. And then emergency. Now the last one, Let's uh, focus our attention on the last uh, because this is quite different from the, the previous five. It is necessary to pursue the legitimate interest of the uh, PIC. So, therefore, can you process, if you are a PIC, can you process personal information just because it is for the purpose of your own legitimate interest? And the answer is yes, but subject to three tests. Next slide. So, okay, these are the three tests. The purpose test, are you pursuing a legitimate interest? Okay, not contrary to law, morals, good caution, public order, public policy. Second, necessity test. Is the processing really necessary for that particular purpose? And the last one is balancing test. Do the individual's uh, interest override legitimate interest? So, meaning, uh, which one is is, is um more prep more important the rights of the data set under the constitution or legitimate interest of uh, of uh, the data subject so there has to be balancing between those two interests individual interest under the constitution and legitimate interest of the pic now of course uh it requires appreciation of all relevant facts and information next okay next Okay, so what are the rights of a data subject? So to my mind, this is the likely question on data privacy law. I, I, I remember, and I told this to some of you, I remember distinctly when uh, Justice Marvick uh, met with the law deans when uh, the turnover of uh, duties, no? uh, well, so how should I say, in the occasion of a turnover of functions from chairman, uh, Justice Telly Bernabe to Justice Marvin Jonen. So he met with the dean. That was about two years ago, right? Two years ago, but I remember distinctly what he said. So there will be a question on data privacy about the, the right to remove or request, let's say, Google to remove certain data if the same is inaccurate or false or incomplete. So let's take a look first. What are the rights of a data subject? So this is our keyword, Ibar of CD. Ibar of Sidin or Sidibina, whatever you may want to refer to it. I stands for the right to be informed. The right to be informed. The right to be informed whether or not his uh, personal information is being processed. What is the purpose, scope, extent, who is the PIC that will process the information. Okay. B, the right to uh, block. So right to block includes the right to erase, right? The right to block. So if information is, is uh, let's say, uh, uh, false, rendered false or excessive for the purpose intended by the, uh, the PIC, so the data subject has the right to block or erase the, the data. A, the right to access, access. So if this information has been process. So he has the right to access that information that is into the system of the PIC. All right. And then right to rectify. Rectify is, of course, uh, to change, revise if the data process is has been rendered false or is false, irrelevant, or rendered false or relevant. O is the right to object. The right to object to the processing of uh, his personal information. 
like for direct marketing purposes or uh, profiling purposes. Let, let's say, uh, can a bank bombard the data subject uh, with offer of other products? The depositor, uh, the data subject opened an account, let's say, with the bank. So a relationship was established within the bank and the depositor credit or the relationship is limited to first deposit. But can the bank, let's say, offer uh, other products and services to the uh, data subject, the depositor? The answer is no, without the consent of the data subject. So he has the right to uh, object, as I said, to the use of his information for any other purpose except those he agreed with the PIC. Now, the right to object also includes, let's say, he has given the consent already, uh, but can he object to the further processing of uh, his information? Yes. The right, the right to object also includes object, objection to uh, the PIC making a profile about him, his uh, preference as a customer, and then to be passed on, let's say, to a subsidiary or affiliate of, uh, of the PIC. So that's going to be done without the consent of data subject and his right to object to this. And then uh, P stands for uh, portability. Portability, whatever is information processed and stored in the system of the PIC can be um, uh, transferred to the structured format or medium of a data subject. So whatever is stored no, in the system of the PIC can be obtained and should be obtained, captured, obtained by the subject and transferred to his own medium. And then C is the right to uh, file a complaint with the date National Privacy Commission. Now, the right to file a complaint is, of course, subject to exhaustion of admin uh, remedies. Uh, first, you have to uh, notify the PIC of any data privacy breach or security breach. And despite the uh, report or complaint you made, with the uh, PIC and acted upon by the PIC. So in case of inaction, within 15 days, you can file a complaint with the National Privacy Commission. And um, of course, you have six months to do so or 30 days in the last communication, whichever is uh, earlier. Now, um, I, it escaped my uh, memory a while ago, but now I remember it. Previously, I'm sorry, recently, I'm sorry, recently, the National Privacy Commission uh, ordered Google. Google, of course, is a PIC, right? So it's search engine uh, uh, operator to take down or remove the websites of online lending companies that shame their borrowers for non-payment of the loan. So how do they shame uh, the borrowers, the delinquent borrowers? by sharing the information about the default of the borrower to his friends on Facebook. All right. So <laughs> according to the National Privacy Commission, that is a low processing of information, right? The information of the borrower given to you, right? Uh, it, it, you, can, you can process information because of a contract relationship with the subject, but you cannot use that information for any other purpose. You cannot share, right? The same with, uh, you cannot use information for sharing to other other persons. Uh, if more so in this case, it takes the shame, no? the borrower. So if his friends in Facebook will get to know that the borrower has not paid his obligation, it may prompt or pressure the borrower to pay his obligation to uh, the lender, the online lender. So that's why the National Privacy Commission ordered Google to take down its websites and they did. Okay, uh, D, the right, of course, to ask for damages. Uh, damages uh, in case of, in case the information process is false, incomplete, or rendered false, irrelevant, or incomplete. So rendered false or irrelevant, or in excess of the purpose specified by the PIC. So let's repeat, a bar of CD, the right to be informed, the right to block, the right to access, the right to rectify, right to object, right of portability, right to file a complaint, and the right to ask for damages. Okay. Next. Okay, okay, next. 
Okay, this is uh, my own question. I compose it. Because I remember what <laughs> Jess Barbie said, there will be a question data privacy about uh, uh, removal of uh, personal data in the search engine operator. Uh, data from the search engine operator. So Amber May works as a prostitute. One of her patrons was found dead in his posh condo in Makati. Based on the CCTV footage, Amber May was seen in and out of the condo unit two days earlier. Amber May became the instant suspect and eventually charged with murder. The story hugged the headlines and caught public attention. The trial was covered by online and print media every phase of the proceedings. The names of all parties involved in the trial, including the lawyers, but more particularly Amber May, are likewise conspicuously posted in all search engine operators like Google. After the trial, Amber May was acquitted. Turning a new leaf, she reformed herself and put up an online business. So ditch her being a prostitute, put up an online business that eventually became a success. However, every time Amber May and her friends make a search on the basis of the name Amber May, the list of results displayed include her being a prostitute and the murder case. She cries out of frustration and wants to have all those posts removed and forgotten by the public. So what is the right to be forgotten? And what's the appropriate remedy available to her under the data privacy law? So the right to be forgotten is a right recognized by the Court of Justice of the EU, allowing the data subject to request a search engine operator like Google, which is a data controller, of course, to have the particular information about him. So every time they search about his name, no longer be linked to his name by a list of results displayed following a search on his name. If this information has become is false, irrelevant, or rendered false or irrelevant or excessive for the purpose intended by the, uh, by the PIC. Now, is the right to be forgotten included as a right of data subject under data privacy law? In the elimination of Ibar of CD, so there is no right to be forgotten, right? So, but is the right to be forgotten likewise a right under the data privacy law or not? So the 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 well the um, I will say so the um, the common the common uh, notion is that the right to be forgotten is subsumed or embraced under the right to block and erase. So the right to block, remove, and erase. Uh, these are broad enough to include the right to be forgotten. Next. The right to be forgotten is recognized in the form of right of erasure, blocking, and the DPA that the state data subject may suspend, withdraw, order the blocking, removal, destruction of his or her information from the PIC's controller filing system upon discovery and proof that the personal information are incomplete, outdated, false, unlawfully obtained, and used for unauthorized purpose. And not going sorry for the purpose they were collected. Okay. The purposes they were collected. So it was the remedy available to be Amber May as Google, right? the search engine operator, which is a PIC, to remove those posts because they have been rendered false and no longer true. And if the search engine operator, Google, refuses, file a complaint for WS. Next. Now, I made the right to be forgotten the last slide. Uh, I have said this many times, you will never be forgotten. Your batches are unique and special. You're the most ready of them all when it comes to state of preparedness. So nothing beats your batches. The ordeal you're going through is likewise unparalleled. You are due for triumph. You are due for victory. Congratulations, therefore, in advance. And I wish you the best. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, now and ever shall be world without an end. Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much, Dean Neil Hadivina, for sharing with us your extensive knowledge on commercial law. We would like to present you a certificate of appreciation. And I would just like to read it. 
Um, the Philippine Association of Law Schools, in collaboration with Rex Bookster and Ed Hampion, awards this certificate of appreciation to Dini Loti Divina for sharing his expertise as a research speaker on Bar Ops Filipinas 2020-2021, the best bar ever webinar lecture series. Given this 19th day of January in the year of our Lord 2022, signed by Dean Jemmy Vito Elfistin, President of the Philippine Association of Law Schools, and Mr. Don Timothy Buhain, CEO of Rex Bookstore. So again, thank you very much, Dean Milo. Also, thank you so much, Rex Bookstore and Ed Hompion for collaborating with us on this event. We would like to mention that our event partner, Rex Bookstore, recently released a free digital copy of Bar Prep, Ready, Set, Pass, a light read on useful tips for the bar exam. This material was prepared by lawyers for would-be lawyers, a product of collective wisdom and born out of shared genuine concern for the profession and the men and women who make it great. You may get your own copy through the link found on the PALS Facebook post. We would like to remind everybody that our frequently asked topics on the eight bar subjects that your series will run every day throughout this week. So tune in tomorrow, same time, and make sure to follow the PALS Facebook page for the roster of speakers and for further updates. We hope that everybody tuned in to our stream right now learned a lot from the like from today's lectures. And thanks again. Have a great, have a great afternoon, and we'll see you all tomorrow.